Hello, everybody. We are back. And um, let's make the lighting a little moodier, because it's time for Troilus and Cressida, which is a tragedy, I think. Um, set during the Trojan War. I've never read this one before. I don't know what to expect. Um, let me just uh, fiddle with the fiddle with the text real quick. Um, and... Uh, Currently reading Troilus and Cressida. And I think um, for this one, I'm going to be joined by a lot of people uh, who are fans of the show. Um, who are going to be playing. So I'm going to be playing Troilus, and I think all the other all the other roles are going to be um, played by, by guest, guest people. Um, two gentlemen of Verona is up next. Um, hopefully I have now fixed uh, all the notifications and stuff, so that's great, um, and let's, um, with guests, cool, I can hear some people in my ears, um, so, so yeah, we've got, um, we've got some guests coming on, which requires a lot of, you know, balancing of microphones and various stuff, but, um, if there's any sort of technical problems, ooh, if there's any technical problems, just bear with us. Um, so, do we have anyone on who can read for us the prologue? That was a certain person's role, so it might need to wait for them to be added. Is that not cup full of ninjas? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, you're a little loud. Okay, uh, let me just bring that back a bit. Is that better? Hey, I fixed the 420 gift. Nice. <laughs> Good. Um, but yeah, I think we're ready to go. Um, any sort of technical problems, please, please do bear with us. This one should be a little bit fun. Um, we'll just see how it goes. And uh, yeah, all right. Well, over to over to whoever's playing product. I'm gonna sit here and have my tea. Okay. Uh, it should just go straight into it. Jump in when you're ready. Red and Chuck can hear me okay and everything. Yep, Chuck can hear me okay. I'm just double checking before we start. Okay, I continue up. How's that? Is that better? Okay, seems like we're good. I'm good to just jump in. Let's do it. Okay. In Troy, there lies the scene. From isles of Greece, the princes Orgilus, their bl high blood chafed, have to the port of Athens sent their ships, fraught with the ministers and instruments of cruel war, 60 and 9, that wore their crownets regal, from the Athenian bay put forth toward Phrygia, and their vow is made to ransack Troy, within whose strong amours the ravished Helen, Menelaus' queen, with wanton Paris sleeps, and that's the quarrel. To Tenedos they come, and the deep drawing barks do there disgorge, their warlike frottage now on Darden plains, the fresh and yet unbruised Greeks do pitch their brave pavilions, Priam's six-gated city, Darden and Timbria, Helius, Cheetus, Troyan and Antenoridus, with massy staples and correspondent and fulfilling boards, spur up the sons of Troy. Now expectation, tickling skittish spirits, on one and other side, Trojan and Greek, sets all on hazard, and hither am I come, a prologue armed but not in confidence of author's pen or actor's voice, but suited in like conditions as our argument, to tell you, fair beholders, that our play leaps over the vaunt and firstlings of those broils, beginning in the middle, 
starting thence away to what may be digested in a play, like or find fault, do as your pleasures are. Now good or bad, tis but the chance of war. Gear now be mended. All of your music. And now Not you can you. hear me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, as I was saying, <laughs> as I was saying, um, I am weaker than a woman's tear. Tamer than sleep, fonder than ignorance, less valiant than the virgin in the night, and skillless as unpractised infancy. I've told you enough of this for my part. I'll not meddle nor make no further. He that will have a cake out of the wheat must needs tarry the grinding. Have I not tarried? But you must tarry the bolting. Have I not tarried? Tarry the bolting, but you must tarry the leavening. Still I have tarried. But here's yet in the wood, hereafter the kneading, the making of the cake, the heating of the oven, and the bake. Nay, you must stay the cooling too, or you may chance to burn your lips. Patience herself, what goddess er, e'er she be, doth lesser blench at sufferance than I do. At Priam's royal table do I sit, and when fair Cressid comes into my thoughts. So traitor, when she comes, when is she thence? Well, she looked yesternight, fairer than ever, I saw her else look. I was about to tell thee, when my heart, as wedged with a sigh, would writhe in twain, lest Hector or my father should perceive me, I have, as when the sun doth light a scorn, buried this sigh in wrinkle of a smile, but sorrow that is couched in seeming gladness is like that mirth fate turns to sudden sadness. There was not somewhat darker than Helen's, well, though, too, there were no more comparison between the women, but for my part, she is my kinswoman. I would not, as I term it, praise her, but I would somebody had heard her talk yesterday as I did. I will not dispraise your sister Cassandra's wit, but... Oh, Pandarus, I tell thee, Pandarus, when I do tell thee, there my hopes lie drowned. Reply not in now in how many fathoms deep they lie in drenched. I tell thee, I am mad in Cressid's love. Their answer she is fair, poured in the open ulcer of my heart. Her eyes, her hair, her cheek, her gait, her voice... Handlest in thy discourse, O oh, that her hand, in whose comparison all whites are ink writing their own reproach, to whose soft seizure the signet's down is harsh and spirit of sense, hard as the palm of ploughman, this thou tell'st me, as true thou tell'st me, when I say I love her. But saying thus, instead of oil and balm, thou layest in every gash that love hath given me the knife that made it. I speak no more than truth. Thou dost not speak so much. Hey, so not meddle in if she be fair, tis the better for her, and she be not, he has the men in her own hands. Good Pandarus. How now, Pandarus? Labor for my travail, ill thought on of her, and ill thought on of you. Gone between and between, but small thanks for my labor. What? Art thou angry, Pandarus? What with me? And to me, therefore, she's not so fair as Helen, and were she not kin to me, she would be as fair on Friday as Helen is on Sunday. But what care I? I care not if she were a black or more. It's all one to me. Say I she is not fair. Do not care whether you do or no. I'm her father, led her to the Greeks, and so I'll tell her the next time I see her. For my part, I'll meddle nor make nor I the matter. Pandarus. Sweet Pandarus. No more to me. I will leave all as I found it, and there an end. And Pandarus leaves. And then some kind of alarm sounds. And I say, Peace, you ungracious clamours. Peace, rude sounds. Fools on both sides. Helen must needs be fair when with your blood you daily paint her thus. I cannot fight upon this argument. It is too starved a subject for my sword. But Pandarus? Oh gods, how do you plague me? I cannot come to Cressid but by Pandar. And he's as tetchy as 
Tetchy to be wooed to woo, as she is stubborn, chaste against all suit. Tell me, Apollo, for thy Daphne's love, what Cressid is, what Panda, and what we. Her bed is India, there she lies, a pearl, between our Ilium and where she resides. Let it be called the wild and wandering flood, ourself the merchant, and this sailing Panda, our doubtful hope, our convoy, and our bark. Dur -dur -dur -dur. Enter Aeneas. How now, Prince Troilus? Wherefore not a field? Because not there this woman's answer sorts, for womanish it is to be from thence. What news, Aeneas, from the field today? That Paris is returned home, home and hurt. By whom, Aeneas? Troilus, by Menelaus. Let Paris bleed, tis but a scar to scorn. Paris is gored with Menelaus' horn. Hark, what good sport is out of town today? Better at home, if would I might were may. But to the sport abroad, are you bound thither? In all swift haste. Come then, we go together. <gasps> and they leave. And in comes Cressida and her man, Alexander. <laughs> and I will adjust it in it. Who were those when by? Queen Hecuba and Helen. And whither go they? Up to the eastern tower, whose height commands as subject all the vale to see the battle. Hector, whose patience is as a virtue fixed, today is moved. He chid Andromache and struck his armor, and, like as there were husbandry in war, before the sun rose he was harnessed light, and to the field goes he, where every flower did, as a prophet, weep what it foresaw in Hector's wrath. What was his cause of anger? The noise goes this. There is among the Greeks a lord of Trojan blood, nephew to Hector. They call him Ajax. Good, and what of him? They say he is a very man per se, and stands alone. So do all men, unless they are drunk, sick, or have no la- This man, lady, hath robbed many beasts of their particular traditions. He is as valiant as the lion, Churlish as the bear, slow as the elephant. A man into whom nature hath so crowded humors that his valor is crushed into folly, his folly sauced with discretion. There is no man half of virtue that he hath not a glimpse of, nor any man an attaint, but he carries some stain of it. He is melancholy without cause, and merry against the hair. He hath the joints of everything, but everything so out of joint, that he is a gaudy briandres, many hands and no use, or purblind argus, all eyes and no sight. But how should this man that makes me smile make Hector angry? They say he yesterday coped Hector in the battle and struck him down. The disdain and shame whereof hath ever since kept Hector fasting and waking. Who comes here? Madam, your uncle, Pandarus. Hector's a gallant man. As may be in the world, lady. What's that? What's that? Good morrow, Uncle Pandar. Good morrow, cousin Cressid. Good morrow, Alexander. How do you, cousin? When were you at Ilium? This morning, un When I came, was Hector armed and gone ere ye come to Ilium? Helen was not up, was she? Hector was gone, but Helen was not. Even so, early. That we were talking of, and of his age. Was he angry? He, so says he, so he says. I know the cause, too. He'll lay about him today, I can tell him that. And there's Troilus will not come far behind him. Let them take heed of Troilus, I can tell them that, too. What is he angry to? Who, Troilus? Troilus is the better man of the two. Oh, Jupiter, there's no comparison. What, not between Troilus and Hector? Do you know a man if you see him? I, if I ever, if I ever saw him before. I 
say Troilus is Troilus. Then you say as I say, for I am sure he is not. Nor Hector is not Troilus in some degrees. Tis just to each of them he is himself. Alas, poor Troilus, I would he were. So he is. In addition, I had gone barefoot to India. He is not Hector. No, he's not himself, would have were himself. While the gods are above, time must friend or end. Well, Troilus, well, I would my heart were in her body. No, Hector is not a better man than Troilus. Excuse me? Zelder. Pardon me, pardon me. Too, you shall tell me another tale when the others come to it. Hector shall not have his wit this year. He shall not need it if he have his or his qualities. No matter his beauty. Twould not become him his own special judgment, niece. Helen herself swore the other day that Troilus for a brown favor, so so tis, I must confess, not brown neither. No, but truth, brown and not brown. To say the truth, true and not true. Praise his complexion above Paris. Why, Paris hath color enough. He has. Then Troilus should have too much, if she praised him above. His complexion is higher than his, he having color enough. And the other higher is too flaming a praise for a good complexion. I had as leaf Helen's golden tongue had commended Troilus for a copy. I swear to you, loves him better than Paris. Then she's a merry Greek indeed. Nay, I'm sure she does. She came in the other day into the compassed window. He has not passed three or four hairs on his chin. Indeed, a tapster's arithmetic may soon bring his particulars there into a time. He is very young, and yet will he, within three pounds, lift as much as his brother Hector. Is he so young a man, and so old a prove to you that Helen loves him. It's me her white hand to his cloven chin. Juno, have mercy, how came it cloven? Why, you know tis dimpled, I think his smiling becomes him better than any man in all Phrygia. Oh, he smiles valiantly. Oh, yes, and twere a cloud in autumn. Then, but to prove to you that Helen loves Troilus. Troilus will stand to the proof, if you'll prove it so. Why, he esteems her no more than I esteem an idle egg. If you love an idle egg as well as you love an idle head, you would eat chickens in the shed. Uh, is my mic not coming through? Uh, hold on, can I do voice activity then? Be better. Okay, I think for technical reasons, we may have been slightly overambitious on the number of guests that we need. Um, so in the interest of, uh, of speeding us through um, and also for maintaining consistent audio quality, I might just have to pick up and we might just have to have like one or two uh, guests with um, uh, like making, making sure that they've got like good quality of microphones and stuff. Um,
But anyway, um, Pandarus and Cressida were just in the middle of a conversation. Um, <laughs> I think they were having a laugh. Um, and we'll we'll try and get more talking about eggs. Talking about eggs. Um, I think we'll try and get more um, guests on uh, later on if we can uh, if we can sort the quality out. In the meantime, I might just have to I might just have to take over. Sorry. Um, and uh, I'll leave Alice and uh, and Izzy to um, see if we can sort out the the rest of it. Um, we are here for you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, check if the bit rate is high enough. That might be. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um. So. Um. Where were we? Oh yeah. <laughs> then they were having a laugh. Um. And Cressida says, "But there was more temperate fire under the pot of her eyes. Did her eyes run over too?" And Hector laughed. And what was all this laughing? Marry at the white hair that Helen spied on Troilus' chin. And had been a green hair, I should have laughed too. They laughed not so much at the hair as his pretty answer. What was his answer? Quoth she, he's but two and fifty hairs on your chin, and one of them is white. This is her question. That's true, make no question of that. Two and fifty hairs, quoth he, and one white. That white hair is my father, and all the rest are his sons. Jupiter, quoth she, which of this hairs is Paris, my husband? The forked one, quoth he, plucked out and give it him. But there was such laughing, and Helen so blushed, and Paris so chafed, and all the rest so laughed that it passed. So let it now. For it has been a great while going by. Well, cousin, I told you a thing yesterday. Think on't. So do I. I'll be sworn tis true. He will weep you, and twere a man born in April. <laughs> and then uh, a retreat is sounded. -da -da. And I'll spring up in his tears, and twere a nettle against May. Hark, they're coming from the field. Shall we stand up here and see them as they pass toward Ilium? Good niece, do, sweet niece Cressida. At your pleasure. Here, here, here's an excellent place. Here we may see most bravely. I'll tell you them all by their names as they pass, but mark Troilus above the rest. Um, so Aeneas enters and he passes over as they're all coming back from battle. Um, speak not so loud. That's Aeneas. Is not that a brave man? He's one of the flowers of Troy, I can tell you. But mark Troilus, you shall see anon. Who's that? Uh, enter Antentor and passes over. That's Antentor. He has a shrewd wit, I can tell you, and he's a man good enough. He's one of the soundest judgment in Troy, whosoever, and a proper man of person. And when comes Troilus, I'll show you Troilus anon. If he see me, you shall see him nod at me. Will he give you the nod? You shall see. If he do, the rich shall have more. And enter Hector. Hector's the hero of, um, Hector's the hero of Troy. And he comes in. Pino says, that's Hector. That, that, look you. That, there's a fellow. Go thy way, Hector. There's a brave man, niece. Oh, brave Hector. Look how he looks. There's a countenance. It's not a brave man. Oh, brave man. Is it not? It does a man's heart good. Look you what hacks are on his helmet. Look at yonder, do you see? Look you there. There's no jesting. There's laying on. Take off who will, as they say. There be hacks. Be those with swords? And enter Paris. Paris comes in. Paris is, um... Uh, Paris is Helen's boyfriend. Um, and uh, Paris passes by. And Pandora says, Swords, anything he cares not. And the devil come to him, it's all one. By God's lid, it does one's heart good. Yonder comes Paris. Yonder comes Paris. Look ye yonder, niece. It's not a gallant man, too, it's not. Why, this is brave now. Who said he came hurt home today? He's not hurt. Why, this will do Helen's heart good now, eh? Would I could see Troilus now. You shall see Troilus anon. Who's that? Helenus goes past. That's Helenus. I marvel where Troilus is. That's Helenus. I think he went not forth today. There's Helenus. Can Helenus fight, uncle? Helenus? No. But yes, it will fight him different well. I marvel where Troilus is. Hark, do you not hear the people cry? Troilus. Helenus is a priest. What sneaking fellow comes yonder? And Troilus comes in. Where? Yonder? Oh, that, that's uh, Dave Phobus. Oh, tis Troilus. There's a man, niece. Hem, brave Troilus, the prince of chivalry. Peace for shame. Peace. Oh, m mark him. Note him. Oh, brave Troilus. Look well upon him, niece. Look how you see his sword is bloodied, and his helm more hacked than Hector's, and how he looks and how he goes. Oh, admirable youth. He ne'er saw three and twenty. Go thy way, Troilus, go thy way. Had I a sister were a grace or a daughter a goddess, he should take his choice. Oh, admirable man. Paris? Pff, Paris is dirt to him. And I warrant Helen to change would give money to boot. And then here come some more soldiers. Here come more. Asses, fools, dolts, chaff and bran, chaff and bran, porridge after meat. I could live and die in the eyes of Troilus. Ne'er look, ne'er look, the eagles are gone. Crows and doors, crows and doors. I'd rather be such a man as Troilus than Agamemnon and all Greece. There is among the Greeks Achilles. 
a better man than Troilus. Achilles? A drayman, a porter, a very camel. Well, well. Well, well, why have you any discretion? Have you any eyes? Do you know what a man is? Is not birth, beauty, good shape, discourse, manhood, learning, gentleness, virtue, youth, liberality, and so forth, the spice and salt that seasons a man? I, a minced man, and then to be baked with no date in the pie, for then the man's date's out. You are such another woman. One knows not at what ward you lie. Upon my back to defend my belly, upon my wit to defend my wiles, upon my secrecy to defend my honesty, my mask to defend my beauty, and you to defend all these. And at all these wards I lie at, at a thousand watches. Say one of your watches. Nay, I'll watch you for that. And that's one of the chiefest of them, too. If I cannot ward what I would not have hit, I can watch you for telling how I took the blow, unless it swell past hiding, and then it's past watching. In comes Troilus's boy, his, um, his, like, servant. You are such another. And the boy says, uh, Sir, uh, m my lord would instantly speak with you. Where? At, at your own house. Good boy, tell him I come. I doubt he be hurt. Fare ye well, good niece. Adieu, uncle. I'll be with you, niece, by and by. To bring, uncle, I, a token from Troilus. By the same token, you are aboard. Pandarus leaves, and Cressid is left alone. Words, vows, gifts, tears, and love's full sacrifice he offers in another's enterprise. But more in Troilus thousandfold I see than in the glass of Pandar's praise may be. Yet hold I off. Women are angels wooing. Things won are done. Joy's soul lies in the doing. That she beloved knows naught that knows not this. Men prize the thing ungained more than it is. That she was never yet that ever knew. Love got so sweet as when desire did sue. Therefore this maxim out of love I teach. Achievement is command, ungained beseech. That though my heart's contents firm love doth bear, nothing of that shall from mine eyes appear. And she leaves. So I don't actually know the plot to this one, so I'm kind of discovering it as I go. Um... So I guess Cressida really does love Troilus, but she's just being a little bit sneaky about it. Um, anyway, scene three. Here comes Agamemnon, Nestor, Ulysses, that's Odysseus, uh, Diomedes, Menelaus, all the Greek lads. All the lads are here. The Greek lads, they're here. Um, and Agamemnon is king of the Greeks, right? He's king. What kind of a voice should we give Agamemnon? Um, it can't be Sean Connery again. <laughs> Sean Connery can't be all the kings. Um... But all right. Uh, princes, what grief hath set the jaundice on your cheeks? The ample proposition that hope makes in all designs begun on earth below fails in the promised largeness. Checks and disasters grow in the veins of actions highest reared as knots by the conflux of meeting sap infect the sound pine and diverts his grain tortive and errant from his course of growth. Nor, princes, is it matter new to us that we come short of our suppose so far that after seven years' siege... Yet Troy walls stand, saith every action that hath gone before, whereof we have record. Trial did draw by us and thwart, not answering the aim, and that unbodied figure of the thought that gave to Sir Miser's shape. Why then, you princes, do you with cheeks abashed behold our works and think them shame? Which are indeed naught else but the protractive trials of great Jove, to find persistence, constancy in men, the fineness of which metal is not found in fortune's love. For then the bold and coward, the wise and fool, the artist and unread, the hard and soft, seem all affined and kin. But in the wind and tempest of her frown, distinction with a loud and powerful fan, puffing at all, winnows the light away. And what hath mass or matter by itself lies rich in virtue and unmingled. And Nestor says, isn't Nestor, isn't Nestor an old man? He's an old man. I think so. I seem, I seem to remember my Iliad. Well, he's going to be an old man in my version, anyway. With due observance of thy godly seat, great Agamemnon, Nestor shall apply thy latest words. In the reproof of chance lies the true proof of men, the sea being smooth. How many shallow bauble boasts dare sail upon her patient breast, making their way with those of nobler bulk? But let the ruffian Boreas once enrage thy gentle Thetis, and anon behold the strong ribbed bark through liquid mountains cut, bounding between the two moist elements like Perseus' horse, where's then the saucy boat, whose weak untimbered sides but even now co-rivaled greatness, either to harbour fled or made a toast for Neptune. Even so doth valour's show and valour's worth divide in storms of fortune. 
For in her ray and brightness the herd hath more annoyance by the breeze than by the tiger, but when the splitting wind makes flexible the knees of knotted oaks and flies under the shade, why then the thing of courage, as roused with rage, doth sympathize, and with an accent tuned in self-same key, retires to chiding fortune. <laughs> I, I imagine Nestor is probably an old man, because um, he's got that kind of rambling quality that um, that the old man... What's the old man's name in Hamlet again? I forget, we'll get to it. I'm getting tired. Um, but he's got that kind of rambling quality to his speech <laughs> as he bounces between the moist elements. <laughs> Polonius. Thank you, Chad. Polonius. Um, anyway, here's Odysseus, Ulysses. Um, he's a clever, he's a clever, sh he's sharp, isn't he, Odysseus? Let's give him, um, he was Sean Bean in the film, so. Agamemnon, our great commander, nerve and bone of Greece, Heart of our numbers, soul and only spirit, in whom the tempers and the minds of all should be shut up. Hear what Ulysses speaks. Besides the applause and approbation, the which most mighty for thy place and sway, and thou most most revered for thy stretched out life, I give to both your speeches, which were such as Agamemnon and the hand of Greece should hold or pie in brass, and such again as venerable Nestor, hatched in silver, should with a bond of air, strong as the axle tree in which the heavens ride, knit all the Greeks ears to his experienced tongue. That was right, he was an old man. Yet let it please both, thou great and wise, to hear Ulysses speak. Speak, Prince of Ithaca, and beard of less expect than matter needless of importless burden. Divide thy lips, then we are confident when rank Thersistes opens his mastic jaws, we shall hear music, wit, and oracle. Troy, yet upon basis, had been down, and the great Hector's sword had lacked a master but for these instances. The speciality of rule hath been neglected, and look how many a Grecian tents do stand hollow upon this plain, so many hollow factions, and that the general is not like the hive to whom the foragers shall all repair what honey is expected. Degree being visited, the unworthiest shows as fairly in the mask. The heavens themselves, the planets in this centre, observe degree, Priority in place, in sister, course, proportion, season, form, office and custom in all line of order, and therefore is the glorious planet Sol, in noble eminence, enthroned and sphered amidst the other, whose medicinable eye corrects the ill aspects of planets evil, and posts, like the commandment of a king, sans check to good and bad. But when the planets in evil mixture, to disorder wander, what plagues and what portents, what mutiny, what raging of the sea, shaking of earth, commotion in the winds, frights, changes, horrors, divert and crack, rend and deracinate the unity and married calm of states quite from their fixture. Or when degree is shaked, which is the ladder to all high designs, the enterprise is sick. How could communities, degrees in schools and brotherhoods in cities, peaceful commence from dividable shores? The primogenitor and due of birth, prerogative of age, crowns, scepters, laurels, but by degree stand in authentic place. Take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows. Each thing meets in mere repugnancy. The bounded waters should lift their bosoms higher than the shores and make a sop of all this solid globe. Strength should be lord of imbecility, and the rude son should strike his father dead. Force should be right, or rather right and wrong between whose endless jar justice resides, should lose their names, and so should justice too, then everything includes itself in power, power into will, will into appetite, and appetite, and universal wolf, so doubly seconded with will and power, must make perforce an universal prey, and last eat up himself. Great Agamemnon, this chaos, when degree is suffocate, follows the choking. And this neglection of degree is it, that by a pace goes backward in a purpose it hath to climb. The generals disdained by him one step below, he by the next, that next by him beneath, so every step example by the first pace that is sick of his superior grows to an envious fever, a pale and bloodless emulation. And tis this fever that keeps Troy on foot, not her own sinews, to end a tale of length. Troy in our weakness lives, not in her strength. It's quite a speech. This is water, by the way. So, Odysseus says, It's not because Troy is strong, it's because we're all shit. <laughs> and Nestor says, Most wisely hath Ulysses here discovered the fever, whereof all our power is sick. The nature of the sickness found, Ulysses. What is the remedy? The great Achilles 
whom opinion crowns the sinew and the forehand of our host, having in his ear full of airy fame, grows dainty of his worth, and in his tent lies mocking our designs. With him, Patroclus. With him lies mocking our designs. With him, Patroclus. All right, I guess that's why. Lies mocking our designs. With him, Patroclus, upon a lazy bed, the live long day, breaks scurril jests, and with ridiculous and awkward action, which slanderer he imitation calls, he pageants us. Sometime, great Agamemnon, at thy topless deputation he puts on, and like a strutting player whose conceit lies in his hamstring, and doth think it rich to hear the wooden dialogue and sound, twixt his stretched footing and the scaffoldage, such to be pitied and arrested seeming, he acts thy greatness in, and when he speaks, tis like a chime amending with terms unsquared, which from the tongue of roaring Typhon dropped with see my burbulies. At this fusty stuff, the large Achilles, on his pressed bed lolling, from his deep chest laughs out a loud applause, cries, Excellent, tis Agamemnon just. Now play me Nestor, hum and stroke thy beard, and as being dressed to some oration, that's done, as near the as near as the extremist ends of parallels, as like as Vulcan and his wife, yet God Achilles still cries, Excellent, tis Nestor right, now play him me, Patroclus, arming to answer in a night alarm, and then forsooth the faint defects of age must be the scene of mirth to cough and spit, and with a palsy fumbling of his gorget, shake in and out the rivet, and at this sport Sir Valadius cries, Oh, enough, Patroclus, oh, give me ribs of steel, I shall split all the pleasure of my spleen. And in this fashion, all our abilities, gifts, Natures, shapes, severals and generals of grace, ex of grace exact, achievements, plots, orders, preventions, excitements of the field, or speech for truce, success or loss, what is or is not, serves as stuff for these two to make paradoxes. And in the imitation of these twain, who, as Ulysses says, opinion crowns, with an imperial voice, many are in fact. Ajax is grown self-willed, and bears his head in such a reign, in full as proud a place as broad Achilles, and keeps his tent like him, makes factious feasts, rails on our state of war, bold as an oracle, and sets Thersistides, a slave whose gall coins slanders like a mint, to match us in comparisons with dirt, to weaken and discredit our exposure, how ranks soever rounded in with danger. They tax our policy, and call it cowardice. Count wisdom as no member of the war, forestall prescience, and esteem no act but that of hand, the still and mental parts, that do contrive how many hands shall strike when fitness calls them on, and know by measure of their observant toil the enemy's weight. Why, this hath not a finger's dignity. They call this bedwork, mappery, closet war, so that the ram that batters down the wall for the great swing and rudeness of his poise, they place before his hand that make the engine or those that with the fineness of their souls by reason guide his execution. Let this be granted, and Achilles' horse makes many Thetis's sons. Da, 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 da. What trumpet? Look, Menelaus. From Troy. And Aeneas comes in. What would you for our tent? Is this great Agamemnon's tent, I pray you? Even this. May one that is a herald and a prince do a fair message to his kingly ears? With surety stronger than Achilles' arm for all the Greekish heads, which with one voice called Agamemnon head and general. Fair leave and large security. How many a stranger to those most imperial looks know them from eyes of other mortals? How? I. I ask that I might waken reverence and on the cheek be ready with a blush, modest as morning when she coldly eyes the youthful Phoebus. Which is that god in office guiding men? Which is the high and mighty Agamemnon? This Trojan scorns us, or the men of Troy are ceremonious courtiers, courtiers as free, as debonair, unarmed, as bending angels, that's their fame in peace. But when they would seem soldiers, they have gauls, good arms, strong joints, true swords, and Jove's accord. Nothing so full of heart. But peace, Aeneas, peace, Trojan, lay thy finger on their lips. The worthiness of praise disdains his worth, if that the praised himself bring thee praise forth. But what the repining enemy commends, that breath fame blows, that praise soul pure transcends. Sir, you of Troy, call yourself Aeneas. I, Greek, that is my name. What's your affair, I pray you? Sir, pardon, tis for Agamemnon's ears. He hears naught privately that comes from Troy. Nor I from Troy come not to whisper him, I bring a trumpet to awake his ear, to set his sense on the attentive beat, and then to speak. Speak frankly as the wind. It is not Agamemnon's speaking hour. That thou shalt know, Trojan, he is awake. He tells thee so himself. Trumpet blow loud. 
Send thy brass voice through all these lazy tents, and every Greek of metal let him know what Troy means fairly shall be spoke aloud. Dun 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 dun! We have, great Agamemnon, here in Troy, a prince called Hector. Priam is his father, who in this dull and long-continued truce is rusty grown. He bade me take a trumpet, and to this purpose speak. Kings, princes, lords, if there be one amongst the fairest of Greece that holds his honour higher than his ease, that seeks his praise more than he fears his peril, that knows his valour and knows not his fear, that loves his mistress more than in confession, with taunt, with truant vows to hear her own lips he loves, and dare avow her beauty and her worth in other arms than hers, to him this challenge. Hector, in view of Trojans and of Greeks, shall make it good, or do his best to do it. He hath a lady, wiser, fairer, truer, than ever Greek did compass in his arms, and will tomorrow with his trumpet call, midway between your tents and walls of Troy, to rouse a Grecian that is true in love. If any come, Hector shall honour him. If none, he'll say in Troy when he retires, the Grecian dames are sunburnt and not worth the splinter of a lance. Even so much. This shall be told our lovers, Lord Aeneas. If none of them have soul in such a kind, we left them all at home. But we are soldiers. And may that soldier a mere recreant prove that means not, hath not, or is not in love. If then one is, or hath, or means to be, that one meets Hector. If none else, I'll be he. Tell him of Nestor, one that was a man when Hector's grandsire sucked. <laughs> he is old now. <laughs> Hector's grandsire sucked. <laughs> ah. He is old now, but if there be not in our Grecian mould one noble man that hath one spark of fire to answer for his love, tell him from me I'll hide my silver beard in a gold beaver, and in my vant brants put this withered bronze, and meeting him will tell him that my lady was fairer than his grandam, and as chaste as may be in the world, his youth in flood I'll pawn this truth with my three drops of blood. Now heavens forfend such scarcity of youth. I don't know why Aeneas has slowly become the sheriff, sheriff of Nottingham from um, Blazing Saddles. But not blazing saddles, Robin Hood many tights, but he, he is. <laughs> Amen. Fair Lord Aeneas, let me touch your hand. To our pavilion shall I lead you first. Achilles shall have word of this intent. So shall each Lord of Greece from tent to tent. Yourself shall feast with us before you go and find the welcome of a noble foe. So everybody leaves. Everybody leaves except uh, Ulysses and Nestor. Nestor. What says Ulysses? I have a young conception in my brain. Be you my time to bring it to some shape. What is't? Tis this. Blunt wedges rive hard knots. The seeded pride that hath to this maturity blown up in rank Achilles must or now be cropped, or shredding breed a nursery of like evil to overbulk us all. Well, and how? This challenge that the gallant Hector sends, however it is spread in general name, relates in purpose only to Achilles. The purpose is perspicuous even as substance whose grossness little characters sum up, and in the publication make no strain but that Achilles, were his brain as barren as banks of Libya, though Apollo knows tis dry enough, will with speed of great speed of judgment I with celerity, celerity, find Hector's purpose pointing on him, and wake him to the answer, think you. Yes, tis most meet. Who may you else suppose that can from Hector bring his honour off, if not Achilles? That be a sportful combat. Yet in this trial much opinion dwells, for here the Trojans taste our dearest repute with their finced palate. And trust to me, Ulysses, our imputation shall be oddly poised in this wild action. For the success, although particular, shall give a scantling of good or bad unto the general, and in such indexes, those small, or those small pricks to their subsequent volumes, there is seen the baby figure of the giant mass of things to come at large. It is supposed he that meets Hector issues from our choice, and choice being mutual act of all our souls makes merit her election, and doth boil as twere from forth as all a man distilled out of our virtues, who miscarrying what heart from hence receives the con conquering part to steal a strong opinion to themselves, which entertained limbs are his instruments in no less working than our swords and bows directed by the limbs. Give pardon to my speech, therefore tis meet Achilles meet not Hector. Let us, like merchants, show our foulest wares, and think perchance they'll sell, if not, the lustre of the better yet to show, shall show the better. Do not consent that ever Hector and Achilles meet, for both our honour and our shame in this are dogged with two strange followers. I see them not with my old eyes, what are they? What glory our Achilles shares from Hector, were he not proud, we all should wear with him. 
but he already is too insolent, and we were better parched in Afric's sun than in the pride and salt scorn of his eyes should he escape Hector Fair. If he were foiled, well then we did our main opinion crush in taint of our best man, nor make a lottery. And by device, let blockish Ajax draw the sword to fight with Hector. Among ourselves, give him allowance as the worthier man, for that will physic the great Miramion who boils in loud applause and make him fall his crest and prouder than blue iris bends. If the dull, brainless Ajax comes safe off, we'll dress him up in voices. If he fail, yet go we under our opinion still that we are better men. But hit or miss, our project's life the shape of sense assumes. Ajax employed plucks down Achilles' plumes. Now, Ulysses, I begin to relish thy advice, and I will give a taste of it forthwith to Agamemnon. Go we to him straight, two curs shall tame each other. Pride alone must tar the mastiffs on as twere their bone. And so they leave. So I think um, that Achilles and... Uh, so Odysseus doesn't want Achilles and Hector to fight because Achilles is in a bad mood and he might lose. <laughs> so they're going to send Ajax in instead. What's that? Cool, cool. So we'll go on to intermission. Um, not now, we'll keep going. Oh my gosh, we've already raised seventeen and, and, and seventeen thousand dollars and change. <laughs> we are currently on Act Two, Scene One. We're about to start it. Here we go. Enter Ajax and uh, Thersites, who is his uh, his slave. So Ajax, they just said Ajax is really dumb. So I give him a. Well, no, I was about to give him a Geordie accent, but I'm not going to give him a Geordie accent because he's dumb. I'm going to give him a Geordie accent because he's, like, big and strong and cool. Um, sorry, it's a car going past. Um, Thersides. Agamemnon, how if he had boils full all over, generally. Thersides. And those boils did run. Say so, did not the general run? Were not that a botchy core? Dog. Then there would come some matter from him. I see none now. And so Ajax beats his slave. Thou bitch wolf son, canst thou not hear? Feel then, the plague of Greece upon thee, thou mongrel beef-witted lord. Speak then, thou winest leaven, speak. I will beat thee into handsomeness. I shall sooner rail thee into wit and holiness, but I think thy horse will sooner con an oration than thou learn a prayer without books. Thou canst strike, canst thou, a red marine of the jades, tricks. Toward stool, learn me the proclamation. Dost thou think I have no sense? Thou strikest me thus. The proclamation. Thou art proclaimed a fool, I think. Do not, porcupine, do not, my fingers itch. I would thou didst itch from head to foot, and I the scratching of thee. I would make thee a loathsomest scab in Greece. I see the proclamation. Thou grumblest and railest every hour on Achilles, and thou art as full of envy at his greatness, as Kerberos is at Prosperina's beauty, and that thou barkst at him. Mistress Thersides, thou should strikest him, Kobloth. He would pun thee into shivers with his fist as a sailor breaks a biscuit. You horse on cur, do, do, thou stool for a witch. I do, do, thou sodden-witted lord. Thou hast no more brain than I have in mine elbows. And a cynico may tutor thee, thou scurvy valiant ass. Thou art here but to thrash Trojans. And thou art bought and sold among those of any wit, thou a barbarian slave. If thou use to beat me, I will begin at thy heel and tell what thou art by inches. Thou thing of no bowels, thou... You dog, you scurvy lord, you cur. Mars, his idiot. Do rudeness, do, camel, do, do. And then Ajax just beats the shit out of his slave. <laughs> Enter Achilles and Patroclus, his lover. It is implied. Um, Achilles. Achilles was Brad Pitt in the original, wasn't he? Well, not the original. <laughs> in, the, in, the orig in the Troy movie. Anyway, here comes Achilles. Why? How now, Ajax, wherefore do you this? How now, Thersites, what's the matter, man? You see him there, do you? Aye. What's the matter? Nay, look upon him. So I do. What's the matter? Nay, but regard him well. Well, why I do so? But yet you'd not lock well upon him, for whomsoever you take him to be, he is Ajax. I know that, fool. Aye, but that fool knows not himself. Therefore I beat thee. Lo, 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 what modicums of wit he utters, his evasions of ears thus long. I have bobbed his brain more than he has beat my bones. I will buy nine sparrows for a penny, and his pyre martyr is not worth the ninth part of a sparrow. This lord, Achilles, Ajax, who wears his wit in his belly and his guts in his head, I tell you what I say of him. What? I say, this Ajax, nay, good Ajax, has not so much wit, nay, I must hold you, as will stop the eye of Helen's needle for whom he comes to fight. 
peace, fool. I would have peace and quietness, but the fool will not. He there, that he, look you there. Out, oh, thou damned cur, I shall... Will you set your wit to a fool's? No, I warrant you, for a fool's will shame it. And then Patroclus says, Good words, Thestes. What's the quarrel? I bid the vile owl go learn me the tenor of the proclamation, and he rails upon me. I serve thee not. Well, go to, go to. I serve here voluntary. Your last service was sufferance was not voluntary no man is beaten voluntary ajax was here at the voluntary and you was under an impress e'en so a great deal of your wit too lies in your sinews or else there be liars hector shall have a great catch if he knock out either of your brains he were as good crack a fusty nut with no kernel oh what with me too thersites there's ulysses an old nestor whose wit was mouldy ere eh? your grandsires had nails on their toes yoke you like draught oxen and make you plough up the war what what? Yes, good sooth. To Achilles. To Ajax. To... I shall cut out your tongue. Oh, tis no matter. I shall speak as much as thou afterwards. No more words, Thersites. Peace. I will hold my peace when Achilles break bids me, shall I? There's for you, Patroclus. I will see you hanged like clodpoles, ere I come any more to your tents. I will keep where there is wit stirring, and leave the fraction of fools. And so he leaves. Patroclus says, Good riddance. Marry, marry this, sir, is proclaimed through all our host, that Hector, by the fifth hour of the sun, will with a trumpet twixt our tents and Troy tomorrow morning come call some knight to arms that hath a stomach, and such a one that dare maintain, I know not what, tis trash. Farewell. Farewell? Who shall answer him? I know not. Tis put to lottery, otherwise he knew his man. Or oh, meaning you. I will go learn more of it. Ajax goes off. I don't think Ajax and Achilles get on. <laughs> so here comes Priam, king of Troy, Hector, his son, Troilus, Paris, who uh, was Orlando Bloom, and uh, Helenus. Is Helenus the same as Helen? No. No. I just Helen Troy and Okay, cool. Helenus is not the same as Helen. <laughs> okay. Here comes Priam. <laughs> I need more voices. I need. I need. It's gonna have to be Sean Connery again. <laughs> I don't think I could do. No, no, because um, in Time Bandits, um, Priam was played by Sean Connery, so it works. It works. After so many hours, <laughs> lives. Speeches spent thus once again, says Nestor from the Greeks, deliver Helen and all damage else as on a loss of time to avail expense, wounds, friends, and what else dear that is consumed in hot digestion of this corporate war shall be struck off. Hector, what share you to it? And Hector says, um, Though no man less fears the Greeks than I, as far as touches my particular, yet dread Priam, there is no lady of more softer bowels, more spongy to suck in the sense of fear, more ready to cry out who knows what follows than Hector is. The wound of peace is surety. Surety secure, but modest doubt is called the beacon of the wise, the tent that searches to the bottom of the worst. Let Helen go. Since the first sword was drawn about this question, every tithe soul amongst many thousand dimes hath been as dear as Helen. I mean of ours. If we have lost so many tenths of ours to guard a thing not ours nor worth to us, had it our name, the value of one ten, what merits in that reason which denies the yielding of our up? And Troila says, Fie, fie, my brother! Were you the worth and honour of a king, so great as our dread father in a scale of common ounces? Will you with counters sum the past proportion of his infinite, and buckle in a waist more fathomless with spans and inches so diminutive as fears and reasons? Fie, for godly shame! And then Helenus says, No marvel, though you bite so sharp at reasons, you are empty of them. Should not our father bear the great sway of his affairs with reasons, because your speech hath none that tells him so? You are for dreams and slumbers, brother priest. You fur your gloves with reason. Here are your reasons. You know an enemy intends you harm. You know a sword employed is perilous, and reason flies the object of all harm. Who marvels then when Helenus beholds a Grecian and his sword, if he do set the very wings of reason to his heels, and fly like chidden mercury from Jove, or like a star disorbed? Nay, if we talk of reason, let's shut our gates and sleep. Manhood and honour should have hard hearts. Would they but fat their thoughts with this crammed reason? Reason and respect makes livers pale and lusty with deject. And Hector says, Brother, she is not worth what she doth cost the holding. What's aught but as tis valued? 
But value dwells not in particular will. It holds his estimate and dignity as well wherein tis precious of itself as in the prizer. Tis mad idolatry to make the service greater than the god, and the will dotes that is inclinable to what infectiously itself affects without some image of the affected merit. I take today a wife. And my election is led on it in conduct of my will, my will enkindled by mine eyes and ears, two traded pilot twixt the dangerous shores of will and judgment. How may I avoid, although my will distaste what is elected the wife I chose? There can be no evasion. To blench from this and to stand firm by honour, we turn not back the silks upon the merchant when we have spoiled them, nor the remainder of viands we do not throw in unrespective sieve, because we are now full. It was thought meet Paris should do some vengeance on the Greeks. Your breath of full consent belied his sails. The seas and winds, old Wranglers, took a truce and did him service. He touched the poor's desired, and for an old aunt whom the Greeks held captive, he bought a Grecian queen, whose youth and freshness wrinkles Apollo's and makes stale the morning. Why keep we her? The Grecians keep our aunt. Is she worth keeping? Why, she is a pearl whose price, price hath launched above a thousand ships and turned crowned kings to merchants. If you'll have ouched was wisdom, Paris went, as you must needs, for you all cried, go, go. If you'll confess he brought home noble prize, as you must needs, for all you clapped your hands and cried, inestimable, why do you now the issue of your proper wisdom's rate and do a deed that fortune never did? Beg at the estimation which you prize richer than land and sea. O theft most base, that we have stolen what we do fear to keep. But thieves unworthy of a thing so stolen that in their country did them that disgrace we fear to warrant in our native place. Enter Cassandra at a distance. And she says, Cry, Trojans, cry. She was always my favourite character in the animated Hercules. Priam says, What noise? What shriek is this? Tis our mad sister, I do know her voice. Cry, Trojans. It is Cassandra. Cry, Trojans, cry, lend me ten thousand eyes, and I will fill them with prophetic tears. Peace, sister, peace, virgins and boys, mid-age and wrinkled old, soft infancy that nothing can but cry, add to my clamour. Let us pay the times a moiety of that mass of moan to come. Cry, Trojans, cry, practice your eyes with tears. Troy must not be, nor goodly Ilium stand, our firebrand brother Paris burns us all. Cry, Trojans, cry, a Helen and a woe. Cry, cry, Troy burns, or else let Helen go. And she leaves. Because Cassandra, we remember, can see the future. Now Hector, who's getting more and more wraith fines by the minute, says, Now, youthful Troilus, do not these high strains of divination in our sister work some touches of remorse? Or is your blood so madly hot that no discourse of reason nor fear of bad success in a bad cause can qualify the same? Why, brother Hector, we may not think the justness of each act such and no other than event doth form it, nor one deject the courage of our minds because Cassandra's mad. Her brain-sick raptures cannot distaste the goodness of a quarrel which hath our several honours all engaged to make it gracious. For my private part, I'm no more touched than all Priam's sons, and Jove forbid there should be done amongst us such things as might offend the weaker spleen to fight for and maintain. And Paris, who hasn't said much until now, says, Else might the world convince of levity as well my undertakings as your counsels. But I attest the gods your full consent gave wings to my repension and cut off all fears attending on so dire a project. For what, alas, can these my single arms, what propagation is, is in one man's valour to stand and push in enmity of those this quarrel would excite? Yet I protest, were I alone to pass the difficulties, as had as ample power as I have will, Paris should ne'er retract what he hath done, nor faint in the pursuit. Paris, you speak like one beshotted on your sweet delight. You have the honey still, but these the gall. Show to be valiant is no praise at all. Sir, I propose not merely to myself. The pleasures such a beauty brings with it, but I would have the soil of her fair... Oh. Well, that is what's written. But I would have the soil of her fair rape, wiped off in honourable keeping her. What treason were it to the ransacked queen, disgrace to your great worths and shame to me now to deliver her possession up on terms of base compulsion? Can it be that so degenerate a strain as this should once set footing in your generous bosoms? There's not the meanest spirit on our party without a heart to dare or sword to draw when Helen is defended, nor none so noble whose life were ill bestowed or death unfamed where Helen is the subject. Then I say, well may we fight for her whom we know well the world's large spaces cannot parallel. Paris 
and Troilus, you have both said well, and on the cause and question now in hand have glozed, but superficially not much, unlike young men whom Aristotle thought unfit to hear moral philosophy. The reasons you allege do more conduce to the hot passion of distempered blood than to make up a free determination twixt right and wrong, for pleasure and revenge have ears more deaf than adders to the voice of any true decision. Nature craves all dues be rendered to their owners. Now, what nearer debt in all humanity than wife is to the husband? If this law of nature be corrupted through affection, and that great minds of partial indulgence to their benumbed benumbered wills resist the same, there is a law in each well-ordered nation to curb those raging appetites that are most disobedient and refractory. If Helen then be wife to Sparta's king, as it is known she is, these moral laws of nature and of nations speak aloud to have her back returned. Thus to persist in doing wrong extenuates not wrong, but makes it much more heavy. Hector's opinion is this in way of truth, yet ne'ertheless, my sprightly brethren, I propend to you in resolution to keep Helen still, for it is a cause that hath an mean dependence upon our joint and several dignities. Why, there you touch the life of our design. Were it not glory that we more affected than the performance of our heaving spleens, I would not wish a drop of Trojan blood spent more in her defence. But worthy Hector, she is a theme of honour and renown, a spirit of valiant and magnanimous deeds, whose present courage may beat down our foes, and fame in time to come canonise us. For I presume brave Hector... Hector would not lose so rich advantage of a promised glory as smiles upon the forehead of this action for the wide world's revenue. I am yours, you valiant offspring of great Primus. I have a roisting challenge set amongst the dull and factious nobles of the Greeks will strike amazement to their drowsy spirits. I was advertised their great general slept whilst emulation in the army crept. This, I presume, will wake him. And so they leave. <gasps> so... That very long scene, nothing happened or was advanced. I can see why this play is not often performed. Anyway. Moving on to Act 2, Scene 3. Um, let me look ahead to see when it would be a good time to take the intermission. Um, so, let's... Um, well, let's keep going. Let's take it scene by scene. Because um, there's just like a few smaller scenes coming up, thankfully. So here comes Thersites, who um, is the funny the funny slave from before who Ajax was beating up. Who says, How now, Thersites, what lost in the labyrinth of thy fury? Shall the elephant Ajax carry it thus? He beats me and I rail at him. Oh, worthy satisfaction. Would it were otherwise that I could beat him whilst he railed at me? His foot I learned to conjure and raise devils, but I'll see some issue of my spiteful execrations. Oh, then there's Achilles, a rare engineer. If Troy be not taken till these two undermine it, the walls will stand till they fall of themselves. O oh, thou great thunder darter of Olympus, forget thou that thou art Jove, the king of gods, and Mercury lose all the serpentine craft of thy caduceus, if thou take not that little, little, less than little wit from them that they have, which short-armed ignorance itself knows is so abundant scarce, it will not in circumvention deliver a fly from a spider without drawing the massy irons and cutting the web. After this the vengeance on the whole camp, or rather the bone ache, for that methinks it is the curse dependent on those that war for a placket. I have said my prayers, and devil envy say amen. A what ho, my lord Achilles? Enter Patroclus, uh, Patroclus from the tent. Who's there? Thersites! Good Thersites, come in and rail! If I could have remembered a guilt counterfeit, that wouldst not have slipped out of my contemplation. But it is no matter thyself upon thyself, the common curse of mankind. Folly and ignorance be thine in great revenue. Heaven bless thee from a tutor, and discipline come not near thee. Let thy blood be thy direction till thy death. Then if she that lays thee out says thou art a fair corpse, I'll be sworn and sworn upon she never shrouded any but Lazar's. Amen. Where's Achilles? What? Art thou devout? Wast thou in a prayer? Aye, the heavens hear me. In comes Achilles. Who's there? Thersites, my lord. Where? Where? Art thou come? Why, my cheese, my digestion, why hast thou not served thyself into my table so many meals? Come, come. What's Agamemnon? Thy commander, Achilles. Then tell me, Patroclus, what's Achilles? Oh, thy lord, Thersites. Then tell me, I pray thee, what's thyself? Thy knower, Patroclus. Then tell me, Patroclus, what art thou? That, 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 thou mayst tell that that knowest. Oh, tell, tell. I'll decline the whole question. Agamemnon commands Achilles. Achilles is my lord. I am Patroclus's knower. 
and Patroclus is a fool. You rascal! Peace, fool, I have not done. He is a privileged man. Proceed, Thersites. Agamemnon is a fool, Achilles is a fool, Thersites is a fool, and as Athol said, Patroclus is a fool. Derive this, come. Agamemnon is a fool to offer to command Achilles. Achilles is a fool to be commanded of Agamemnon, Thersites is a fool to serve such a fool, and Patroclus is a, is a fool positive. Why am I a fool? Enter Agamemnon, Ulysses, Nestor, Diomedes, Ajax, and Calchas at a distance. I think we're going to have some more overhearing here. Classic. Let me just move this so I can lean back a little. Oh, oh there, that's a bit nicer. Make that demand to the creator. It suffices me thou art. Oh, look you, who comes here? Patroclus, I'll speak with nobody. Come in with me, Thersites. So Achilles has gone back to his tent. He's just lying around in his tent all day, having cracking gags. Here is such passagery, such juggling and such knavery. All the argument is a cuckold and a whore. Again with the cucks. A good quarrel to draw emulations, factions and bleed to death upon. Now the dry serpigeo on the subject and war and lechery confound all. And he leaves. And Agamemnon says, Where is Achilles? Oh, within his tent. Uh, but uh, ill disposed, my lord. Let it be known to him that we are here. He shent our messengers, and we lay by our appertainments visiting of him. Let him be told of, so perchance he think we dare not move the question of our place, or know not what we are. Yeah, I, yeah, I shall say so to him. We saw him at the opening of his tent. He is not sick. Yes, lion sick. Sick a proud heart. You may call it melancholy if you will fear for the man, but by my head it is pride. But why, why? Let him show us the cause. A word, my lord. Ajax and Agamemnon go off and they speak. What moves Ajax thus to bay at him? Achilles hath inveigled his fool from him. Who? Thersites, he. Then will Ajax lack matter if he have lost his argument? No, you see, he is his argument that has his argument. Achilles. All the better, their fraction is more our wish than their faction. But it was a strong counsel that a fool could disunite. The amnity that wisdom knits not, folly may easily untie. Patroclus comes back. Here comes Patroclus. No Achilles with him. The elephant hath joints, but none for courtesy. His legs are legs for necessity, not flight. Uh, Achilles bids me say he is much sorry if anything more than your sport and pleasure did move your greatness and this noble state to call upon him. He hopes it is no other, but for your health and your digestion's sake and after dinner's breath. Hear you, Patroclus. We are too well acquainted with these answers, but his evasion, winged thus swift with scorn, cannot outfly our apprehensions. Much attribute he hath, and much the reason why we ascribe it to him, yet all his virtues, not virtuously of his own part beheld, do in our eyes begin to lose their gloss. Yea, and like fair fruit in an unwholesome dish, are like to rot untasted. Go and tell him we came to speak with him, and you shall not sin if you do say we think him overproud and under honest in self-assumption greater than in the note of judgment, and worthier than himself, he attends the savage strangeness he puts on, disguise the holy strength of their command, and underwrite in an observing hand his humorous predominance, yea, watch his pettish loons, his ebbs, his flows, as if the passage and whole carriage of this action rode on his tide. Go tell him this, and add that if he overhold his price so much, will none of him, but let him like an engine not portable lie under this report. Bring action hither, this cannot go to war. A stirring dwarf we do allowance give before a sleeping giant. Tell him so. Uh, I shall, and just... You know, you know, bring his answer presently. In second voice will not be satisfied. We come to speak with him. Ulysses, enter you. So they send in Odysseus. What is he more than another? No more than what he thinks he is. Is he so much? Do you not think he thinks himself a better man than I am? No question. Will you subscribe his thought and say he is? No, noble Ajax. You are as strong, as valiant, as wise, no less noble, much more gentle, and altogether more tractable. Why should a man be proud? How doth pride grow? I know not what it is. Your mind is the clearer, Ajax, and your virtue is the, flat, the fairer. He that is proud eats up himself. Pride is his own glass, his own trumpet, his own chronicle. And whatever praises itself, but in the deed devours the deed in the praise. Ulysses comes back. I do hate a proud man as I hate the engendering of toads. Oh, yet he loves himself. Is not strange. Ulysses will not to the field tomorrow. 
What's his excuse? He doth rely on none, but carries on the stream of his dispose without observance or respect of any, in will peculiar and in self-admission. Why will he not upon our fair request untent his person and share the air with us? Things small as nothing for request's sake only he makes important, possessed he is with greatness, and speaks not to himself but with a pride that quarrels at self-breath, imagined worth holds in his blood such swollen and hot discourse that twixt his mental and his active parts, kingdom to Achilles in commotion rages and batters against itself. What should I say? He is so plaguy proud that the death tokens of it cry no recovery. Let Ajax go to him. Dear Lord, go you and greet him in his tent. Tis said he holds you well, and will be led at your request a little from himself. O oh, Agamemnon, let it not be so. We'll consecrate the steps that Ajax makes when they go from Achilles. Shall the proud lord that based his arrogance with his own seam, and never suffers matter of the world, enter his thoughts, save such as do revolve and ruminate himself? Shall he be worshipped, of that we hold an idol more than he? No, this thrice worthy and right valiant lord must not so stale his palm, nobly acquired, nor by my will a subjugate his merit as amply titled as Achilles is by going to Achilles, that were to enlard his fat already pride and add more cause to cancer when he burns with entertaining great Hyperion. This lord go to him, Jupiter forbid, and say in thunder, Achilles, go to him. Oh, this is well. He rubs the vein of him, Nestor says as an aside. So I think they're trying to like, I think they're trying to like hype Ajax up to like make them. <laughs> anyway. And Diomedes, who hasn't spoken yet, says, And how his silence drinks up this applause. <laughs> if I go to him with my armoured fist, I'll pash him with a fist. Oh no, you shall not go. And a proud be with me, I'll feeze his pride. Let me go to him, not for the worth that hangs upon our quarrel. A, a paltry, insolent fellow. How he describes himself. Can he not be sociable? The raven chides blackness. I'll let his humour's blood... He will be the physician, that should be the patient. So they're all taking the piss out of Ajax here. <laughs> it's brutal. Every time he says something, they're like, <laughs> they're like, nah, you suck. <laughs> and all men were on my mind. Wit would be out of fashion. I should not bear it so. I should eat swords first. Shall pride carry it? And would you'd carry half. I would have ten snares. I will need him. I'll make him supple. He's not yet through warm. Force him with praises. Pour in, pour in. His ambition is dry. My lord... You feed too much on this dislike. Our noble general, do not so. You must prepare a fight without Achilles, says Diomedes. Um, why, tis the naming of him doth him harm. Here is a man, but tis before his face, I will be silent. Wherefore should you so? He is not emulous as Achilles is. Nor the whole world, he is as valiant. A horse and dog that shall polter thus with us, would he were a Trojan. What a vice were it in Ajax now. If he were proud, or covetous of praise, ay, or surly born, or strange, or self-afflicted, thank the heavens, Lord, thou art of sweet composure. Praise him that got thee, she that gave thee suck. Fame be thy tutor, and thy parts of nature, thrice famed beyond, beyond all erudition. But he that disciplined thy arms to fight, let Mars divide eternity in twain, and give him half, and for thy vigour, bull-bearing Milo his addition, yield to sinewy Ajax. I will not praise thy wisdom, which like a born, a pale, a sure, confide to thy spacious and dilated parts. Here is Nestor, instructed by the antiquary times, he must, he is, he cannot but be wise. But pardon, Father Nestor, were your days as green as Ajax, and your brain so tempered, you should not have the eminence of him, but be as Ajax. Shall I call you father? Aye, my good son. Be ruled by him, Lord Ajax. There is no tarrying here. The heart Achilles keeps thicket. Please it our general to call together all his state of war. Fresh kings are come to Troy. Tomorrow... We must with all our mean of power stand fast, and here's a lord come knights from east to west and cull their flower. Ajax shall cope the best. Go we to council. Let Achilles sleep. Light boats may sail swift, the greater bulks draw deep. So again, we have a scene in which nothing really happens or moves forward. We see where this is, uh, we see where this one is um, not performed often. Mm. So, um, to recap everyone on the plot, uh, it's the Trojan War, everyone's sitting around, there's going to be a duel between Hector and somebody, um, Troilus and Cressida are in love, though we haven't seen them in a while, and we're already on Act 3, so this, this play is all over the place, honestly it's not his best, um, but you know what, you know what the good news is, we're almost up to $19,000 uh, for the Samaritans, which is fantastic, um, so... 
let's keep pushing on through. <laughs> uh, Shubby70 says read Romeo in the Ben Shapiro voice nah 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 I don't think so <laughs> alright um, act three there's music and Pandarus and a servant come in and Pandarus says friend you pray you a word do you not follow the young lord Paris but I sir when he goes before me you depend upon him I mean sir I do depend upon the lord you depend upon a noble gentleman. I needs must praise him. The Lord be praised. You know me, do you not? Faith, sir, superficially. Friends know me better. I am the Lord Pandarus. Oh, no, I've confused Pandarus and Patroclus. My bad. Um, Never mind. We won't go back on it. But uh, we're in the Trojan camp. This is Pandarus, who is Cressidus' uncle. Um, and the servant says, I hope I shall know your honour better. I do desire it. You are in the state of grace? Grace, not so, friend. Honour and lordship are my title. What music is this? I do but partly know, sir. It is music in parts. No, you're the musician. Holy, sir. It's Kim Petrus. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> I had tickets to see Kim Petrus on Tuesday night, which I'm not going to be able to get to, which I'm gutted at. Um, anyway, know you the musicians? Holy, sir. Who play they to? To the hearers, sir. At whose pleasure, friend? At mine, sir. And theirs that love music. Command, I mean, friend. Who shall I command, sir? So here we have a classic Shakespearean back and forth, like, people misunderstanding each other. Friend, we understand not one another. I am too courtly and thou art too cunning. At whose request do these men play? Oh, that's to it indeed, sir. Marry, sir, at the request of Paris, my lord, who's there in person with him, the mortal Venus, the heart blood of beauty, love's invisible soul. Who? My cousin Cressida? Uh, no, sir, Helen. Could not you find out that by her attributes? It should seem, fellow, that thou hast not seen the Lady Cressida. I come to speak with Paris from the Prince of Troilus. From, from the Prince Troilus, I will make a complimental assault upon him for my business seeds. Sodden business. There's a stewed phrase indeed. So in comes Paris and Helen. Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world. Uh, who, again, it's just going to be me. <laughs> um... And Pandora says, Fair be to you, my lord, and to all this fair company. Fair desires in all fair measure fairly guide them, especially to you, fair queen. Fair thoughts be your fair pillow. Dear lord, you are full of fair words. It's almost Miss Piggy, Helen. Dear lord, you are full of fair words. <laughs> you speak your fair pleasure, sweet queen. Fair prince, here is good broken music. You have it broke, cousin, and by my life you shall make it whole again. She'll piece it out with the piece of your performance. Now, he's full of harmony. Truly, Lady No. Oh, sir. <laughs> rude in sooth, in good sooth, very rude. Well said, my lord. Well, you say so in fits. I have business to my lord, dear queen. My lord, will you vouchsafe me a word? Nay, this shall not hedge us out. We'll hear you sing, certainly. Well, sweet queen, you are pleasant with me, but marry thus, my lord, my dear lord, and my most esteemed friend, your brother Troilus, my lord Pandarus, honey, sweet lord, go to, sweet queen, go to commends himself most affectionately to you. You shall not bob us out of our melody if you do our melancholy upon your head. So she doesn't want him to interrupt the music. Sweet queen, sweet queen, that's a sweet queen, if faith. And to make a sweet lady sad is a sour offence. Nay, that shall not serve your turn, that shall it not. In truth, la, n nay, I, I care not for such words. No, no, and my lord, he desires you that if the king call for him at supper, you will make his excuse. My lord Pandarus, what says my sweet queen? My very, very sweet queen. What uh, what exploits in hand? Where sups he tonight? Nay, but my lord, what says my sweet queen? My cousin will fall out with you. You must not know where he sups, with my disposer Cressida. No, no, no such matter. You are wide. Come, your disposer is sick. Well, I'll make excuse. Aye, my good lord, what should you say, Cressida? No, your poor disposer's sick. I spy. You spy? What do you spy? Come give me an instrument. Now, some, somebody gives him a musical instrument. <laughs> Absolute ridiculous scene. Now, sweet queen, why, this is kindly done. My niece is horrible in love with a thing you have, sweet queen. There's a pun. <laughs> so in Shakespearean, so much ado about nothing, like thing means penis. Uh, so, um, Helen... <laughs> well. <laughs> My niece is horrible in love with a thing you have, sweet queen. <laughs> Helen is trans. <laughs> she shall have it, my lord, if it be not my lord Paris. He, 
No, she'll none of him. They two are twain. Falling in after falling out may make them three. Come, come, I'll hear no more of this. I'll sing you a song now. Ay, 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 prithee now. By my troth, sweet lord, thou hast a fine forehead. Ay, you may, you may. Let thy song be love. This love will undo us all. Oh, Cupid, Cupid, Cupid. Love, I thou it shall, I faith. Ay, good now. Love, love, nothing but love. So they're making him sing a song. In good troth, it begins so. Love, love, nothing but love, still more for, oh, love's how shoots buck and doe. The shaft confounds, not that it wounds, but stickles till the sore. These lovers cry, oh, ho, they die, yet that which seems the wound to kill doth turn, oh, ho, to ha, ha, ha. So dying love lives still, oh, ho, a while, but ha, 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 hey, ho. In love, if faith to the very tip of the nose. He eats nothing but doves, love, and that breeds hot blood, and hot blood begets hot thoughts, and hot thoughts beget hot deeds, and hot deeds is love. Is this the generation of love? Hot blood, hot thoughts, and hot deeds, why they are vipers. Is love a generation of vipers? Sweet Lord, who's a field today? Hector, Deiphobus, Helenus, and Tenor, and all the gallantry of Troy. I would fain have armed today, but... Uh, my Nell would not have it so. How chance my brother Troilus went not? He hangs the lip at something you know all, Lord Pandarus. Not I. Honey, sweet queen. I long to hear how they sped today. You'll remember your brother's excuse? To a hair. Farewell, sweet queen. Commend me to your niece. I will, sweet queen. Dur -dur -dur -dur. Somebody sounds a retreat. They come from field. Let us to Priam's hall to greet the warriors. Sweet Helen, I must woo you to help unarm our Hector. His stubborn buckles with these your white enchanting fingers touched shall more obey than to the edge of steel or force of Greekish sinews. You shall do more than all the island kings. Disarm great Hector. Twill make us proud to be his servant Paris. Yea, what he shall receive of us in duty gives us more palm in beauty than we have. Yea, overshines ourself. Sweet, above thought, I love thee. And so they leave. <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, we're, we've now midway through Act 3. Um, so why don't we take a little bit of intermission so I can rest a little bit. Um, and then I think there's some tech stuff we need to sort out as well. So let's, uh, let's take a little bit of a break and we'll be back uh, shortly. Oh my gosh, we're, over, we're almost at 20 grand. Wow. Wow. Okay, let's keep pushing through. All right, let's take a quick break.
and we're back. Um, so we now have uh, a few guests who I think are going to be helping me with some of the other roles. So um, somebody's going to be playing uh, Achilles and also on like messengers and boys and and you know Patroclus's man and all the rest of it. Um, and we also have um, I think somebody who's going to be playing Helen and Cressida. Um, just to save my voice from jumping up and down in the octave. So, um, welcome to my two, uh, welcome to my two guests, who I hello. Hello, that was you. Sounded very digitized there. Um, okay. Well. Um, <laughs> Alright, well I can't I can't hear anybody, so we'll just have to press on, I think. And if nobody appears, then I'll just have to take the lights. Um <clears throat> uh, so we're on Act Three, Scene Two. Uh, here comes Pandarus and Troilus's man. And Pandarus says, How now? Where's thy master? At my cousin Cressida's? And then it's me. Uh no it's No just... sir, he stays for no to conduct him rather. Sorry, I think Am you're... I still sounding off? Yeah, that's really not working, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Sorry, what was it? You're also what? You're also yeah, 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 I'm, I'm getting that. I am as well. Yeah. Yes, you are. Hmm. Alright, well. Um, huh. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to turn Do down. I sound the... fine? Okay, I'm going to turn that down. I'm going to turn that down. Um, okay. I don't know any any suggestions. So I'm still I'm still coming out all messed up, am I? Okay. No. Unfortunately. All right. Well, let's go to into. Oh, so people are now saying I sound okay. Um, well, anyway, apparently I sound good. Uh, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting serious Dalek vibes from whoever was playing, uh, whoever was, whoever was in there as Cressida. So, um, all right, well, I might just have to crack on and we'll just have to keep working on that. Um, okay. I'll leave, uh, I'll, I'll leave mods and tech team to sort that out. And in the meantime, I'll just keep, keep doing the lot. Um, I'm determined to wear out my vocal cords. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. Uh, anyway. Here comes Pandarus and Troilus's man. And Pandarus says, How now? Where's thy master at my cousin Tra Cressida's? Uh, no, sir, he stays for you to conduct him thither. And Troilus comes in. Um, and Pandarus says, Oh, here he comes. How now? How now? Troilus says, Sirrah, walk off. And the servant goes, have you seen my cousin? No, Pandarus, I stay about her door like a strange soul upon the Stygian bank, staying for waftage. Oh, be thou my car and give me swift transportance to those fields where I may wallow in the lily beds proposed for the deserver. Oh, gentle Pandarus, from Cupid's shoulder pluck his painted wings and fly with me to Cressid. Walk here with the orchard. I'll bring her straight. So, uh, Troilus is still in love with Cressida and wants her uncle to, to help him out. I am giddy. Expectation whirls me round. The imaginary relish is so sweet that it enchants my sense. What will it be when that the watery palates taste indeed love's thrice repurid nectar? Death, I fear me, swooning destruction, or some joy too fine, too subtle potent, turned too sharp in sweetness for the capacity of my ruder powers. I fear it much, and I do fear besides that I shall lose distinction in my joys as doth a battle when they charge on heaps the enemy flying. Pandarus comes in. She's making her ready, she'll come straight. You must be witty now, she does so blush and fetches her wind so short, as if she were frayed with a sprite. I'll fetch her. It is the prettiest villain. She fetches her breath so short as a new tan sparrow. He goes off again. Even such a passion doth embrace, embrace my bosom. My heart beats thicker than a feverous pulse, and all my powers do their bestowing lose, like vassalage at unawares encountering the eye of majesty. Um, and Pandarus comes in with Cressida veiled. We've got more veiling. Pandora says, come, come, what need you blush? Shame's a baby. <laughs> Shame's a baby. 
Here she is now. Swear the oaths now to her that you've sworn to me. What are you gone again? You must be watched, eh? You must be tame, must you? Come your ways, come your ways, and you draw back, or we'll put you to the fills. Why do you not speak to her? Come draw this curtain, and let's see your picture. Alas, the day, how loath you are to offend daylight, and to a dark you'd close sooner. So, 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 rub on, and kiss the mistress. How now, a kiss in fee farm? Build there, carpenter, the air is sweet. Now you shall fight your hearts out ere I part you, the falcon as the, t as the tersel for all the ducks of the river. Go to, go to. And Troilus says, You have bereft me of all words, lady. Words pay no debts, give her deeds, but she'll bereave you of the deeds too, if she call your activity in question. Oh, what, billing again? He's in witness whereof the parties interchangeably. Come in, come in, I'll go get a fire. So, he leaves them alone, finally. And Cressida says, Will you walk in, my lord? Oh, Cressida, how often I have wished me thus. Wished, my lord? The gods grant. Oh, my lord, what should they grant? What makes this pretty abruption? What too curious dreg espies my sweet lady in the fountain of our love? More dregs than water, if my fears have ears. Have eyes. <laughs> fears make devils of cherubims they never see truly. Blind fear that seeing reason leads finds safer footing than blind reason stumbling without fear. To fear the worst oft cures the worse. Oh, let my lady apprehend no fear. In all Cupid's pageant there is presented no monster. Nor nothing monstrous neither. Nothing! But our undertakings, when we vow to weep seas, live in fire, eat rocks, tame tigers, thinking it harder for our mistress to devise imposition enough than for us to undergo any difficulty imposed. This is the monstrosity in love, lady, that the will is infinite and the execution confined, that the desire is boundless and the act a slave to limit. They say all lovers swear more performance than they are able, and yet reserve an ability that they never perform, vowing more than the perfection of ten, and discharging less than the tenth part of one. They that have the voice of lions and the act of hares, are they not monsters? Are there such? Such are not we. Praise us as we are tasted, allow us as we prove. Our head shall go bare till merit crown it. No perfection in reversion shall have a praise in present. We will not name desert before his birth, and being born his addition shall be humble. Few words to the fair faith. Troilus shall be such to Cressid as what envy can say worst shall be a mock for his truth, and what truth can speak truest not truer than Troilus? Will he walk in, my lord? Pandarus comes back in again. Goddamn cock-blocking Pandarus. What? Blushing still? Have you not done talking yet? Well, uncle, what folly I commit, I dedicate to you. I thank you for that. If my lord get a boy of you, you'll give him me. Be true to my lord. If he flinched, chide me for it. You know now your hostages, your uncle's word, and my firm faith. Nay, I'll give my word for her too. Our kindred, though they be long, ere they are wooed. They are constant being one. <laughs> they are burrs. I can tell you they'll stick where they're thrown. Cressida says, Boldness comes to me now and brings my heart. Prince Troilus, I have loved you night and day for many weary months. Why then? Why then was... Why was my Cressid then so hard to win? Hard to seem one, but I was one, my lord. With the first glance that ever... Pardon me, if I confess much, you will play the tyrant. I love you now. But not till now so much but I might master it. In faith I lie. My thoughts were like unbridled children grown too headstrong for their mother. See, we fools, why have I blabbed? Who shall be true to us when we are so unsecret to ourselves? But though I loved you well, I wooed you not. And yet, good faith, I wished myself a man, or that we women had men's privilege of speaking first. Sweet, bid me hold my tongue, for in this rapture I shall surely speak the thing I shall repent. See, see your silence, cunning in dumbness, from my weakness draws my soul of counsel from me. Stop my mouth, and shall, albeit sweet music issues thence. Mwah! And they snog. <laughs> they snog. Woo. Oh my gosh, I think somebody just donated a thousand dollars. Amazing. Fantastic. Right on the snog. So they snog, finally, they kiss. Hooray. Um, Pandarus says, pretty, if faith, who like, still hasn't got the hint and is still watching. Um, my lord, I do beseech you pardon me, t'was not my purpose thus to beg a kiss. I am ashamed. Oh heavens, what have I done? For this time will I take my leave, my lord. You leave, sweet Cressid. Leave? Until you take... And you take leave till tomorrow morning. Pray you content you. What offends you, lady? Sir, mine own company. You cannot shun yourself. Let me go and try. I have a kind of self resides with you, but an unkind self that itself will lead to be another's fool. Where is my wit? 
I would be gone, I speak, I know not what. Well know they what they speak that speak so wisely. Perchance, my lord, I show more craft than love, and fell so roundly to a large confession to angle for your thoughts, but you are wise, or else you love not. For to be wise in love exceeds man's might that dwelt with gods above. Or that I thought it could be in a woman, as if it can, I will presume in you to feed for I her lamp and flames of love, to keep her constancy and plight in youth, outliving beauties outward, with a mind that doth renew swifter than blood decays. Or that persuasion could but thus convince me that my integrity and truth to you might be affronted with the match and weight of such a winnowed purity in love. How were I then uplifted? But alas, I am as true as truth's simplicity, and simpler than the infancy of truth. In that I'll war with you, a virtuous fight. When right with right wars, who shall be most right? True swains in love shall in the world to come approve their truths by Troilus, when their rhymes, full of protest, of oath, and big compare, want similes, truth tired with iteration, as true as steel, as plantage to the moon, as sun to day, as turtle to her mate, as iron to adamant, as earth to the centre, yet after all comparisons of truth, as truth's authentic author to be cited, as true as Troilus shall crown up the verse and sanctify the numbers. Prophet may you be. If I be false, I'll swerve a hair from truth when time is old and hath forgot itself, when water drops have worn the stones of Troy, and blind oblivion swallowed cities up, and mighty states characterless are grated to dusty nothing. Yet let memory, from false to false among false maids in love, upbraid my falsehood, when they've said, as false as air, as water, as wind, as sandy earth, as fox to lamb, as wolf to heifer's calf, pard to the hind or stepdame to her son, yea, let them say, to stick the heart of falsehood as false as cressid. Go to, a bargain made, seal it, seal it. I'll be the witness. Here I hold your hand. Here, my cousins, if ever you prove false to one another since I have taken such pains to bring you together, let all pitiful goers between be called to the world's end after my name. Call them all pandas. Let all constant men be Troilus's, or false women cressids, and all brokers between pandas. Say amen. 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 Whereupon I will show you to a chamber with a bed. Which bed, because it shall not speak of your pretty encounters, press it to death. Away! And Cupid grant all tongue-tied maidens here, bed, chamber, and panda to provide this gear. Damn, panda- like, Pandarus is, is like, full-on Yenta. He, like, ships. He ships it hard. He ships- what's the ship name for Troilus and Cressida? Cressidoilus. Tress- Tress- Tressida. Tressida, obviously. He ships it hard to the extent of getting them a bed. Hey. Cool. How do I do that? Oh, well, why don't we do it after this one? Yeah, do, do this cool. scene. Then... Yeah, let's finish this play and then we'll... Oh, okay, yeah, cool. And then, yeah, cool. I feel quite, um... I quite feel for Troilus and Cressida, who are like two people in love at the time, and, like, with this this big war going on that's just looming over them. Like Brexit. And <laughs> how do they... Somebody in the chat says, who's off screen? That's that's Alice Pope Terry, who's my, my on-site producer. And Izzy is our remote producer. Okie dokie. So. Enter Ulysses, Diomedes, Nestor, Agamemnon, Menelaus, and Calchas. The Greek lads. The Greek lads are here. We're Act 3, Scene 3. And Calchas who I don't think we've had so far, says, Now, princes, for the service I have done you, the advantage of the time prompts me aloud to call for recompense. Appear it to your mind that through the sight I bear in things to come, I have abandoned Troy, left my possession, incurred a traitor's name, exposed myself from certain unpossessed conveniences to doubtful fortunes, sequestering from me all that time, acquaintance, custom, and condition made tame and most familiar to my nature, and here to do you of service and become as new into the world. Strange, unacquainted... I do beseech you, as in way of taste, to give me now a little benefit out of those many registered in promise which, you say, live to come in my behalf. Oh, so Calchas is a traitor. He's, tur he's turned. He's turned sides. And Agamemnon says, What wouldst thou of us, Trojan? Make demand. You have a Trojan prisoner called Antentor. Antenor. Yesterday took. Troy holds him very dear. Oft have you often have you thanks therefore desired my cressid in right great exchange whom troy hath still denied but this antenor oh calchas is is cressidus's father oh, okay 
But this Antenor, I know, is such a rest in their affairs that their negotiations, ne negotiations all must slack, wanting his manage, and they will almost give us a prince of blood, a son of Priam, in change of him. Let him be sent, great princes, and he shall buy my daughter, and her presence shall quite strike off all service I have done in most accepted pain. Let Diomedes bear him and bring us Cressid hither. Calchus shall have what he requests of us. Good Diomed, furnish ye fairly for this interchange, with all bring word if Hector will tomorrow be answered in his challenge. Ajax is ready. Uh, Diomedes, who we never gave a voice to, was like, This shall I undertake, Ajax is ready. Uh, this shall I undertake, and tis a burden which I am proud to bear. And off he goes. And enter, enter Achilles and Patroclus in their tent. Does that mean they bring the tent on with them? Anyway. Oh, oh, they're in the, they, they kind of peek around the entrance of their tent. That's what it is. And Ulysses says, Achilles stands in the entrance of his tent, pleases our general to pass strangely by him, as if he were forgot, and princes all laid negligent and loose regard upon him. I will come last. Tis like he'll question me, why such unplosive eyes are bent, why turned on him. If so, I have derision medicinable to use between your strangeness and his pride, which his own will shall have desire to drink. It may do good, pride had no other glass to show itself but pride. For supple knees feed arrogance and are the proud man's fees. We'll execute your purpose and you put on a form of strangeness as we pass along. So do each lord and either greet him not or else disdainfully, which shall shake him more than if not looked on. I will lead the way. So they're all going to march past Achilles and not look at him. Def Achilles is cancelled. He's been cancelled. They don't talk to him anymore. They've they put him on mute. Achilles says, What? Comes the general to speak with me? You know my mind. I'll fight no more against Troy. What says Achilles? Would he ought with us? Oh, would you, my lord, ought with the general? No. Nothing, my lord. The better. Good day. Good day. They all leave. The lads leave. Achilles is left alone. And Menelaus says... Oh, Menelaus. Uh, Menelaus is uh, Helen's husband. Who was Brian Cox in the, in the film. And Menelaus says, How do you? How do you? Oh, what? Does the cuckold scorn me? And Ajax is there. He says, How now, Patroclus? Good morrow, Ajax. Huh? Good morrow. Aye, and good next dear too. And they all leave. What mean these fellows? No, they're not Achilles? Well, they pass by, strangely. They were used to bend to send their smiles before them to Achilles, to come as humbly as they used to creep to holy altars. What, am I poor of late? To certain greatness, once fallen out with fortune, must fall out with men too. What the declined is, he shall as soon read in the eyes of others as feelers in his own fall. For men like butterflies show not their mealy wings but to the summer. And not a man, for being simply man, hath any honour, but honoured for those honours that are without him, as place, riches, and favour, prizes of accident as oft as merit, which when they fall as being slippery standards, that love that leaned on them as slippery too, doth one pluck down another and together die in the fall. But tis not so with me. Fortune and I are friends. I do enjoy at ample point all that I did possess, save these men's looks. Who do, methinks, find out something not worth in me, such rich beholding as they have often given? Here is Ulysses. I will interrupt his reading. How now, Ulysses? Oh, how now, great uh, great Thetis' son? What are you reading? Well, a strange fellow here writes me that man, how dearly ever parted, how much in having, or without or in, cannot make boast to have that which he hath nor feels not what he owes, but by reflection. And when his virtues shining upon others heat them, and they retort that heat again to the first giver. This is not strange, Ulysses. The beauty that is born here in the face the bearer knows not, but commends itself not going from itself, but eye to eye opposed, salutes each other with each other's form. For speculation turns not to itself, till it hath travelled and is mirrored there, where it may see itself. This is not strange at all. Well, I do not strain it at the uh, position, it is familiar. But at the author's drift, who in his circumstance expressly proves that no man is the lord of anything, though in and of him there is much consisting, till he communicates his parts to others. Nor doth he of himself know them for aught, till he behold them formed in the applause where they are extended, who like an arch reverberate the voice again, or like a great, or like a gate of steel, fronting the sun, receives and renders back his figure in his heat. I was much wrapped in this, and apprehended here immediately the unknown Ajax. Heavens, what a man is there, a very horse! That has he knows not what nature, what things there are, most abject in regard and dear in use, what things again most dear in the esteem and poor in worth. Now shall we see him tomorrow? An act that very chance doth throw upon him, Ajax renowned. Oh, heavens, what some men do while some men leave to do. 
How some men creep in skittish fortune's hall while others play the idiots in her eyes. How one man eats into another's pride while pride is fasting in his wantonness. To see these Grecian lords, why even already they clap the lubber Ajax on the shoulder as if his foot were on brave Hector's breast and great Troy shrinking. I do believe it, for they passed by me as misers do by beggars. Neither gave to me great word or look. What, are my deeds forgot? Oh, I think Achilles is... is Achilles is a bit worried that, that he's lost some clout. Time hath, my lord, a wallet at his back, wherein he puts aims for oblivion, a great-sized monster of ingratitude. Those scraps are good deeds past which are devoured, and so fast as they are made, forgot as soon as done. Perseverance, dear my lord, keeps honour bright to have done is to hang quite out of fashion like a rusty mail in monumental mockery. Take the instant way, for honour travels in a strait so narrow but one goes up but where one goes but abreast. Keep then the path, for emulation hath a thousand sons that one by one pursuit with you give way, or hedge aside from the direct forthright, like to an entered tide they all rush by and leave you hindmost, or like a gallant horse fallen in first rank, lie there for pavement to the abject rear, or run and trampled on, then what they do in present, though less than yours in past, must o'ertop yours, for time is like a fashionable host that slightly shakes his parting guest by the hand, and with his arms outstretched as he would fly, grasps in the coma. The welcome ever smiles, and farewell goes out sighing. Oh, let not virtue seek remuneration for the thing it was for beauty, wit, high birth, vigour of bone, desert in service, love, friendship, charity, all subjects, all to envious and calumniating time. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin, that all with one consent praise newborn gods, though they are made and moulded of things past, and give to dust that is a little guilt more lord than guilt or dusted. The present eye praises the present object. Then marvel not, thou great and complete man, that all the Greeks begin to worship Ajax, since things in motion begin to catch the eye, and what not stirs. The cry went out on me, and still it might, and yet it may again, if thou wouldst not entomb thyself alive and case thy reputation in thy tent, whose glorious deeds but in these fields of late made emulous missions amongst the gods themselves and drave great Mars to faction. Of this my privacy I have strong reasons, but against your privacy the reasons are more port than heroical. Tis known, Achilles, that you are in love with one of Priam's daughters. Ha! <laughs> known? Is that a wonder? The providence that's in a watchful state knows almost every grain of Pluto's gold, finds bottom in the uncomprehensive deeps, keeps place with thought, and almost like the gods, do thoughts unveil in their dumb cradles. There is a mystery with whom relation durst never meddle, in the soul of state, which hath an operation more divine than breath or pen can give expression to. And all the commerce that you've had with Troy, as perfectly as ours as yours, my lord. And better would it fit Achilles much to throw down Hector than Polexia. Poly Polyxena. I guess. But it must grieve young Pyrrhus now at home, when fame shall in our island sound her trump, and all the Greekish girls shall tripping sing, Great Hector's sister did Achilles win, but our great Ajax bravely beat down him. Farewell, my lord. I, as your lover, speak. The fool slides o'er the ice that you should break. And Ulysses leaves. And Patroclus says, To this effect, Achilles, have I moved you? A woman impudent and mannish grown is not more loath than an effeminate man in time of action. I stand condemned for this. They think that my stomach, they think my little stomach to the war and your great love to me restrains you thus. Sweet, rouse yourself, and the weak wanton Cupid shall from your neck unloose his amorous fold and like a dewdrop from the lion's mane be shook to airy air. Shall Ajax fight with Hector? Aye, and perhaps receive much honour by him. I see my reputation is at stake. My fame is shrewdly gored. Oh, then beware. Those wounds heal ill that men did give themselves. Our mission to do what is necessary seals a commission to a blank of danger, and danger like an ague subtly taints even then when we sit idly in the sun. Go call Thersistes hither, sweet Patroclus. I'll send the fool to Ajax and desire him to invite the Trojan lords after the combat to see us here unarmed. I have a woman's longing, an appetite that I am sick with all, to see great Hector in his weeds of peace. Thersites comes in, to talk with him and behold his visage, even to my fuller view. Oh, a labour saved. A, a wonder. What? Ajax goes up and down the field asking for himself. How so? He must fight singly tomorrow with Hector, and is so prophetically proud of an heroical cudgelling that he raves in saying nothing. How can that be? 
where he stalks up and down like a peacock, astride and stand ruminates like a hostess that hath no arithmetic but her brain to set down her reckoning, bites his lip with a politic regard, as who should say, there were wit in this head, and twould out, and so there is, but it lies as coldly in him as fire in a flint, which will not show without knocking. The man's undone for ever, if for Hector break not his neck at a combat, he'll break himself in vain glory. He knows not me. I said, good morrow, Ajax, and he replied, oh, thanks, Agamemnon. What think you of this man that takes me for the general? He's grown a very landfish, languageless, a monster, a plague of opinion. A man may wear it on both sides like a leather jerkin. Thou must be my, thou must be my ambassador to him, Thersites. Who, I? While he'll answer nobody, he professes not answering. Speaking is for beggars. He wears his tongue in arms. I will put on his presence. Let Patroclus make his demands to me. You shall see the pageant of Ajax. To him, Patroclus. Tell him I humbly desire the valiant Ajax to invite the most valorous Hector to come unarmed to my tent and to procure safe conduct for his person of the magnanimous and most illustrious six or seven times honoured Captain General of the Grecian Army, Agamemnon, etc. Do this. Jove bless great Ajax. Ha! I come from the worthy Achilles. Ha! Who most humbly desires you to invite Hector to his tent. Ha! And to procure safe conduct from Agamemnon. Agamemnon? Aye, my lord. Ha! What say you to it? God buy you with all my heart. Your answer, sir. If tomorrow be a fair day, by eleven o'clock it will go one way or other. However, he shall pay me ere he has me. Your answer, sir, fare you well with all my heart. But why? But he is not in this tune, is he? No, but he's out of tune thus. What music will be in him when Hector has knocked out his brains? I know not, but I'm sure none, unless the fiddler Apollo got his sinews to make catlings on. Come, thou shalt bear a letter to him straight. Let me carry another to his horse, for that's the more capable creature. My mind is troubled like a fountain stirred, and I myself see not the bottom of it. So Achilles and Patroclus leave, and Thersites says, With the fountain of your mind were clear again, that I might water an ass at it. I'd rather be a tick and a sheep than such a valiant ignorance. <laughs> I love this. He's great. He's such a piss tick. We're about to start Act 4, Scene 1. Okay. Mm. That lemon, honey, and ginger's really good. Thank you for people donating. Wow, we're already at 21,000 and change. Amazing. <laughs> we haven't even finished the second play. <sighs> ah! <sighs> okay. So, on one side comes Aeneas. Um, and on the other side comes Paris, Diophobus, Antenor, Diomedes, who's Greek. And they all have torches. Um, and Paris says, See ho! Who is that there? And Diophobus says, It is the Lord Aeneas! Is the prince there in person? Had I so good occasion to lie long as you, Prince Paris, nothing but heavenly business should rob my bedmate of my company. <laughs> Everyone keeps telling Paris how fit his girlfriend is. <laughs> uh, had, I, had I so good occasion to lie long as you, Prince Paris, nothing but heavenly business should rob my bedmate of my company. <laughs> That's a damn good line. I'm going to remember that one. That's my mind too. Good morrow, Lord Aeneas. A valiant Greek, Aeneas, take his hand, witness the process of your speech. Within you told how Diomed, in whole week by days, did haunt you in the field. Health to you, valiant sir, during all question of the gentle truce, but when I met you armed, as black defiance as heart can think, or courage execute. The one another Diomed embraces, our bloods are now in calm, and so long health. But when contention and occasion meet by Jove, I'll play the hunter for thy life with all my force, pursuit, and policy. And thou shalt hunt a lion that will fly with his face backward in humane gentleness, Welcome to Troy. Now by Anchise's life, welcome indeed. By Venus' hand, I swear, no man alive can love in such a sort, the thing he means to kill, more excellently. We sympathise, Jove, let Aeneas live, if to my sword his fate be not the glory, a thousand complete courses of the sun, but in mine emulous humour let him die with every joint a wound, and that tomorrow. We know each other well. We do, and long to know each other worse. This is the most despiteful gentle greeting, the noblest hateful love that e'er I heard of. What business, Lord, so early? I was sent for to the king, but why I know not. His purpose meets you. It was to bring this Greek to Calchas's house, and there to render him for the unfreed Antenor, the fair Cressid. Let's have your company, or if you please, haste there before us. And then Paris speaks to Aeneas and says, I constantly do think, or rather call my thought a certain knowledge, my brother Troilus lodges there tonight. Rouse him and give him note of our approach, with the whole quality whereof I fear we shall be much unwelcome. And that I assure you, Troilus, I'd rather Troy were born to Greece than Cressid born from Troy. There is no help. 
the bitter disposition of the time will have it so. On, Lord, we'll follow you. Good morrow, all. And tell me, noble diamond, faith, tell me true. Even in the soul of your sound good fellowship, who in your thoughts merits fair Helen most? Myself or Menelaus? Both alike. He merits well to have her that doth seek her, not making any scruple of her soilure, with such a hell of pain and world of charge, as you as well and you as well to keep her that defend her, not palating the taste of her dishonour with such a costly loss of wealth and friends. He, like a pooling cuckold, would drink up the lees and dregs of a flat tamed peace. You, like a lecher out of whorish loins, are pleased to breed out your inheritors. Both merits poised, each ways no less, no more. But he is he, the heavier for a whore. You are too bitter for your countrymen. She's bitter to her country. Hear me, Paris, for every false drop in her bawdy veins a Grecian's life hath sunk. For every scruple of her contaminated carrion weight a Trojan hath been slain. Since she could speak, she hath not given so many good words breath as for her Greeks and Trojans suffer death. Fair Diomed, you do as Chapman do, dispraise the thing that you desire to buy. But we in silence hold this virtue well. Will not commend what we intend to sell. Here lies our way. Woo! Damn, Di Diomedes, fucking. Welcome to Troy. <laughs> so Troilus and Cressida come in, having just spent the night together for the first time. Oh yeah, and uh, and. Troilus doesn't know that they're coming to take Cressida away because her father has defected. Dear, trouble not yourself. The morn is cold. Then, sweet my lord, I'll call mine uncle down. He shall unbolt the gates. Trouble him not. To bed. To bed. Sleep kill those pretty eyes and give a soft attachment to thy senses as infants empty of all thought. Good morrow, then. I prithee now. To bed. Are you aweary of me? Oh, Cressida, <laughs> but that the busy day, waked by the lark, hath roused the ribald crows, and dreaming night will hide our joys no longer, I would not from thee. Night hath been too brief. Ooh. Prithee tarry. Oh, no, sorry. Night hath been too brief. Beshrew the witch, with venomous whites she stays, as hideously as hell, but flies the grasps of love, with wings more momentary swift than thought. You will catch cold and curse me. Prithee tarry, you men will never tarry. Oh, foolish Cressida, I might have still held off, then you would have tarried. Hark, there's one up. Um, and then Pandarus is off stage, but he says, What's all the doors open here? It is your uncle. Pandarus comes in. A pestilence on him, now he'll be mocking. I shall have such a life. How now? How now? How go maidenheads? <laughs> here you, maid. Where's my cousin, Cressid? Go hang yourself, you naughty mocking uncle. You bring me to do, and then you flout me too. To do what? To do what? Yeah, let us say what? What have you bought? What have you been brought here to do? Come, come, beshrew your heart. You'll ne'er be good, nor suffer others. <laughs> uh, alas, poor wretch. Ah, poor Chipotia. Has not slept tonight. Ooh, would he not? A naughty man. Let it sleep. Ooh, a bugbear take him. There's a knock at the door. Did not I tell you? Would he were knocked to the head? Who's that at the door? Go, uncle. Go and see. My lord, come you again into my chamber. You smile and mock me as if I meant naughtily. <laughs> oh, okay. So she says, My lord, come you again into my chamber. I, you smile and mock me as if I meant naughtily. And Troilus says, Ha ha! Come, you are deceived. I think of no such thing. How earnestly they knock. Pray you, come in. I would not have half of Troy. Have you seen here? So they leave again. Yeah. <laughs> come you again into my chamber. Nice. Nice. This play picked up. <laughs> Uh, so they go off, and Aeneas comes in. Good morrow, lord. Good morrow. Who's there? My lord Aeneas! By my troth, I knew you not. What news with you so early? Is not Prince Troilus here? Here? What should he do here? Come, he is here, my lord. Do not deny him. It doth import him much to speak with me. Is he here? Say you. Tis more than I know, I'll be sworn. For my own part, I, 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 I came in late. What should he do here? Who, nay, then? Come, come, you'll do him wrong, ere you'll wear. You'll be so true to him to be false to him. Do you not know of him, but yet go fetch him hither? Go. Troilus comes in. How now? What's the matter? 
My lord, I scarce have leisure to salute you. My matter is so rash there is at hand. Paris, your brother, and Phobus, the Grecian Diomed, and our Antenor delivered to us and for him forthwith. Ere the first sacrifice within this hour, we must give up to Diomedes' hand the Lady Cressida. Is it concluded so? By Priam and the general state of Troy. They are at hand and ready to effect it. How my achievements mock me. I will go meet them. And my lord Aeneas, we met by chance. You did not find me here. Good, good, my lord. The secrets of nature have not more gift in taciturnity. And so uh, they leave. Troilus and Aeneas leave. Cressida comes in. It's possible. No sooner got but lost. The devil take Antenor. The young prince will go mad. A plague upon Antenor. Would they have broke his neck? How now? What's the matter? Who was here? Uh. Why sigh you so profoundly? Where's my lord? Gone. Tell me, sweet uncle, what's the matter? When I were as deep under the earth as I am above. Oh, the gods, what's the matter? Prithee, get thee in. I would thou hadst never been born. I knew thou wouldst be his death. Oh, poor gentleman, a plague upon Antenor. Good uncle, I beseech you, on my knees, I beseech you, what's the matter? Thou must be gone, wench, thou must be gone, thou art changed for Antenor. Thou must to thy father, and be gone from Troy, lest will be his death. It will be his bane, he cannot bear it. Oh, you immortal gods, I will not go, thou must. I will not, uncle, I have forgot my father. I know no touch of consanguinity, no kin, no love, no blood, nor soul so near me as the sweet Troilus. Oh, you gods divine, make Cressid's name the very crown of falsehood. If ever she leave Troilus, time, force, and death, do to this body what extremity you can. But the strong base and building of my love is as the very centre of the earth, drawing all things to it. I will go in and weep. Do. Do. Tear my bright hair and scratch my praised cheeks. Crack my clear voice with sobs and break my heart with sounding Troilus. I will not go from Troy. Bam! Slams the door. She's off. This got good. I can see how he's like... I'm pretty sure this was written before Romeo and Juliet. And I can see how he's like working up to that. It's like, it's like very like Romeo and Juliet-esqueness here. So here's a short scene. Paris, Troilus, Aeneas, Deophobus, Antenor, and Diomedes all come in, and Paris says, It is great morning, and the hour prefixed of her delivery to this valiant Greek comes fast upon. Good, my brother Troilus, tell you the lady what she is to do, and haste her to the purpose. Walk into her house, I'll bring her to the Grecian presently, and to his hand when I deliver her, think it an altar, and thy brother Troilus a priest there offering to it his heart. I know what tis to love, and would, as I shall pity, I could help. Please you walk in, my lords. Oh, nice little scene between two brothers. Pandarus and Cressida come in. Be moderate, be moderate. Why tell you me of moderation? The grief is fine, full, perfect, that I taste, and no less in a sense as strong as that which, as that which causeth it. How can I moderate it? If I could temporise with my affection, or brew it to a weak and colder palate, the like allayment could I give my grief. My love admits no qualifying dross. Troilus comes in. No more my grief in such a precious loss. Here, 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 here comes a sweet duck. <laughs> oh, Troilus, Troilus. They embrace. What a pair of spectacles is here. Let me embrace too. <laughs> Pandarus is really getting on it. It's like, yeah, me, big group hug. Oh, heart, as is the goodly saying is. Oh, heart, heavy heart, why sighest thou with breaking where he answers again? Because thou canst not ease thy smart by friendship nor by speaking. Then there was never a truer rhyme. Let us cast away nothing, for we may live to have need of such a verse. We see it, we see it. How now, lambs? And Troilus says, Cressid, I love thee in so strange a purity that thee blessed gods as angry with my fancy, more bright in zeal than the devotion which cold lips blow to their deities take thee from me. Have the gods envy? Aye, 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 it is too plain a case. And is it truth that I must go from Troy? A hateful truth. What? And from Troilus too? From Troy and Troilus. Is it possible? And suddenly, where injury of chance puts back leave-taking, jostles roughly by all time of pause, rudely beguiles our lips of all rejoinder, forcibly prevents our locked embrasures, strangles our dear vows even in the birth of our own labouring breath. We too, that with so many thousand sighs did by each other, must poorly sell ourselves with the rude brevity and discharge of one inglorious time now with a robber's haste crams his rich thievery up. He knows not how, as many farewells as be stars in heaven, with distinct breath and consigned kisses to them, he fumbles up into a loose adieu and scants us with a single famished kiss, distasting with the salt of broken tears. 
And Aeneas says, he comes in, he's off stage and he yells, My lord, is the lady ready? Hark, you are called. Some say the genius so cries, Come to him that instantly must die, bid, her, bid them have patience. She shall come anon. Pandarus says, Where are my tears? Rain to lay this wind, or my heart will be blown up by the root. And then he leaves. Cressida says, I must then to the Grecians? No remedy. A woeful Cressid amongst the merry Greeks? When shall we see again? Hear me, my love, be thou but true of heart. I true? How now? What wicked deem is this? Nay, we must use expostulation kindly, for it is parting from us. I speak not be thou true as fearing thee, for I will throw my glove to death himself, that there is no malculation in thy heart. But be thou true, I say, to fashion in my secret protestation. Be thou true, and I will see thee. O, oh, you shall be exposed, my lord, to dangers as infinite as imminent. But I'll be true, and I'll grow friend with danger. Wear this sleeve, and you this glove. When shall I see you? I will corrupt the Grecian sentinels to give thee nightly visitation, but yet be true. O oh, heavens, be true again. Hear why I speak it, love. The Grecian youths are full of quality. Their loving, well composed with gifts of nature, flowing and swelling o'er with arts and exercise, how novelties may move in parts with person. Alas, a kind of godly jealousy, which I beseech you call a virtuous sin, makes me afraid. Oh heavens, you love me not! Die I a villain, then! In this I do not call your faith into question, so mainly as my merit. I, I, I cannot sing, nor heal the high levolt, nor sweeten talk, nor play at subtle games. Fair virtues all, to which the Grecians are most prompt and pregnant. But I can tell that in each grace of these there lurks a still and dumb discoursive devil that tempts most cunningly. But be not tempted. Do you think I will? No, but something may be done that we will not, and sometimes we are devils to ourselves, and we will tempt the frailty of our powers presuming on their changeful potency. Nay, good my lord, come, kiss, and let us part. Paris says within, Brother Troilus, good brother, come you hither, and bring Aeneas and the Grecian with you. My lord, will you be true? Who I? Alas, it is my vice, my fault, whilst others fish with craft for great opinion. I with great truth catch mere simplicity, whilst some with cunning gild their copper crowns with truth and plainness I do wear mine bare. All the Greek lads come in. Not all the Greek lads, but uh, Aeneas. But the, the guys who were doing like the hostage exchange, basically, they'll come in. Fear not my truth. The moral of my weight is plain and true. There's all the reach of it. Welcome, Sir Diomed. Here is the lady which for Antenor we deliver you. At the port, Lord, I'll give her to thy hand. And by the way, possess thee what she is. Entreat her fair. And by my soul, fair Greek, if e'er thou stand at mercy of my sword. Name Cressid, and thy life shall be as safe as Priam is in Ilium. Fair Lady Cressid, so please you say the thanks these prince expects, the lustre in your eye, heaven in your cheek, pleads your fair usage unto Diomed, you shall be mistress, and command him wholly. Ooh, she's gonna have to marry Diomedes. <laughs> I think. Troilus says, Grecian, thou dost not use me courteously to shame the seal of my petition towards the, the, the praising her. I tell thee, Lord of Greece, she is as far high soaring o'er thy praises as thou unworthy to be called her servant. I charge thee use her well, even for my charge, for by the dreadful Pluto, if thou dost not, though the great bulk Achilles be thy guard, I'll cut thy throat. O oh, be not moved, Prince Troilus, let me be privileged by my place and message to be a speaker free... When I am hence, I'll answer to my lust. And I know, my lord, I'll nothing do on charge. To her own worth she shall be prized, but that you say, be it so, I'll speak it in my spirit and honour no. Come to the port, I'll tell thee, Diomed, this brave shall oft make thee to hide thy head. Lady, give me your hand, and as we walk to our own selves, bend we our needful talk. Troilus, Cressida, and Diomedes, leave. Um, dur -dur -dur -dur. Paris says, Hark! Hector's trumpet! Aeneas, how have we spent this morning? The prince must think me tardy and remiss that swore to ride before him in the field. Tis Troilus' fault. Come, come, to field with him. Let us make ready straight. Yea, and with the bridegroom's fresh alacrity, let us address to trend on Hector's heels. The glory of our Troy doth this day lie on his fair worth and single chivalry. <gasps> oh, man, it's, gonna, it's the fight between um, It's the fight between Hector and Ajax. Dun, 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 dun. Boom, 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 boom. Ajax comes in, he's armed, he's got his massive shield with him, 
Achilles is there, Patroclus is there, Agamemnon is there, Menelaus is there, he's a cuck, Ulysses is there, Nestor's there, Calchas is there, and others, it says. Damn, the, all the Greek lads, all the lads are there. It's it's ty- it's fighting times. It's one it's PvP action before the go- before the wars of Troy. And Agamemnon says Here art thou in appointment fresh and fair, anticipating time, with starting courage, give with thy trumpet a loud note to Troy. Thou dreadful Ajax, that the appalled air may pierce the head of the great combatant and hail him hither. Thou trumpet, there's my purse. Now crack thy lungs and split thy breers and pipe. Blow, villain, till thy spherid bias cheek outswell the colic of puffed Aquilian. Come, stretch thy chest and let thy eyes spout blood. Thou blowest for Hector. Da, 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 da. No trumpet answers. Tis but early days. Is not yon Diomed with Calchas daughter? Tis he. I ken the manner of his gait. He rises on the tour. That spirit of his in aspiration lifts him from the earth. Diomedes and Cressida come in. Is this the lady Cressid? Even she? Most dearly welcome to the Greeks, sweet lady. Our general doth salute you with a kiss. Yet is the kindness but particular. Twere better she were kissed in general. Ooh. Alice the monitor's asking if it needs to shut down again. Tis better she were kissed in general. And very courtly counsel. I'll begin. So much for Nestor. Mwah. I'll take that winter from your lips, fair lady. Achilles bids you welcome. Mwah. Ooh, this seems a little creepy. Um, yeah. Menelaus says, I had good argument for kissing once. Ooh! Ooh, Ooh damn. That's a, I appreciate the self-roast from Menelaus. <laughs> I had good argument for kissing once. And Patrick says, But that's no argument for kissing now, for thus popped Paris in his hardiment. O oh, deadly gall and theme of all our scorns, for which we lose our head to gild his horns. The first was Menelaus' kiss, this mine. Patroclus kisses you. Mwah. Menelaus says, Oh, this is trim. Paris and I kiss evermore for him. I'll have my kiss, sir. Lady, by your leave. Ooh, Cressida says, in kissing, do you render or receive? <gasps> Patroclus says, both take and give. I'll make my match to live. The kiss you take is better than you give, therefore no kiss. I'll give you boots, I'll give you three for one. You are an odd man, give even or give none. An odd man, lady, every man is odd. No, Paris is not, for you know tis true that you are odd, and he is even with you. Ooh. She basically just called him a cuck. You fillip me over the head. No, I'll be sworn. If it were no match your nail against his horn, may I, sweet lady, beg a kiss of you? You may. I do desire it. Why beg, then? Why, then, for Venus' sake, give me a kiss. When Helen is a maid again, and his, I am your debtor. Claim it when tis due. Never's my day, and then a kiss of you. Lady, a word. Uh, I'll bring you to your father. Presumably Diomedes is slightly upset that everyone's trying to kiss his wife, or wife-to-be. Um, uh, where was I? A woman of a woman of quick sense. Fie, fie upon her. There's a language in her eye, her cheek, her lip. Nay, her foot speaks, her wanton spirits look out at every joint and motive of her body. Oh, these encounters, so glib of tongue, that give a coasting welcome ere it comes, and wide on clasp the tables of their thoughts to every tickling reader. Set them down for sluttish spoils of opportunity and daughters of the game. Oh, so apparently, <laughs> apparently Ulysses thinks he can spot a woman who isn't a virgin at twenty paces. <laughs> uh, she's a slut. She's already she wouldn't she out she tried to outwit me and therefore she's a slut. <laughs> anyway, um, everybody. Uh, so Diomedes and Cressida leave, um, and then it says, "Enter all of Troy." So dun 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 bum 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 bum. Hector's here. It's your boy Paris. Aeneas is here. Helenus is here. Confusingly, not the same as Helen and attendants. Um, and it's, it says the line all the Trojans trumpet. Everyone goes the Trojans are here. Everyone's here. Well, it's all of Troy. It's your boy Troy. Um, Agamemnon says yonder comes the troop, and Aeneas says hey, he's, he's on a horse for some reason. He says hail all you state of Greece. 
What shall be done to him that victory commands? Or do you purpose a victor shall be known? Will you the knights, or to the edge of all extremity, pursue each other, or shall be divided by any voice or order of the field? Hector bade ask. Which way would Hector have it? He cares not. He'll obey conditions. And Achilles says, "'Tis done like Hector, but securely done, a little proudly and great deal despising the knight approved. If not Achilles, sir, what is your name? If not Achilles, nothing. Therefore, Achilles, but what I know this, in the extremity of great and little, valour and pride excel themselves in Hector, the one almost as infinite as all, the other blank as nothing. Weigh him well, and that which looks like pride is courtesy. This Ajax is half made of Hector's blood, in love whereof half Hector stays at home. Half heart, half hand, half Hector comes to seek this blended knight, half Trojan and half Greek. Achilles says, a maiden battle then. Oh, I perceive you. Diomedes comes in. Agamemnon says, here is Sir Diomed. Go, gentle knight, stand by our Ajax, as you and Lord Aeneas consent upon the order of the field. So be it, either to the uttermost or else a breath. The combatants being kin, half stints their strife before their strokes begin. So Ajax and Hector enter the lists, which is like where people joust, so I'm guessing we're doing not an ancient Greek thing, but uh, they're about to fight anyway. Um, there's going to be a big fight. Uh, it's Ajax v. Hector. It's it's Logan Paul v. whoever that, that guy he fought. KSI. KSI. <laughs> who is who? What? I hate what I know now. <laughs> You're a boxer, you wouldn't know it. <laughs> um, Okie dokie. Uh, Ajax and Hector, they're going to have a fight. Ulysses says, they are opposed already. What Trojan is that same that looks so heavy? The youngest son... Of, oh, no, it's, uh, they, they're looking and say, Who, who's that over there? And Ulysses says, the youngest son of Priam, a true knight. They call him Troilus. Not yet mature, yet matchless, firm of word, speaking in deeds and deedless is his tongue. Not soon provoked, nor being provoked, soon calmed. His heart and hand both open and both free. For what he has, he gives. What thinks, he shows. Yet gives he not till judgment guide his bounty, nor dignifies an impair thought with breath. Manly as Hector, but more dangerous. For Hector, in his blaze of wrath, subscribes to tender objects, but he, in heat of action, is more vindictive than jealous love. They call him Troilus. And on him erect a second hope as fairly built as Hector. Thus says Aeneas, one that knows the youth even to his inches. And with private soul did in great Ilium thus translate him to me. Dun, 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 dun. Hector and Ajax fight. They are in action. And then everyone's cheering. Now, Ajax, hold thy own. Hector, thou sleepst. Awake thee. His blows are well disposed. There, Ajax. Um, you must know more. And then trumpets cease. Um, and then Aeneas stops the fight. He says, princes, enough. So please you. And Ajax says, I'm not warm yet. Let us fight again. Diomedes says, as Hector pleases. And Hector, who hasn't said a lot so far, but who was played by Eric Banner in the film, says, Why then will I no more? Thou art great lord, my father's sister's son, a cousin German to great Priam's seed. The obligation of our blood forbids a gory emulation twixt us twain. Were thy commixed Greek and Trojan so, then thou couldst say, This hand is Grecian all, and this is Trojan, the sinews of this leg all Greek, and this all Troy. My mother's blood runs on the dexter cheek, and this the sinister bounds in my father's. By Jove, multipotent, thou shouldst not bear from me a Greekish member, wherein my sword had not impression made of our rank feud. But thee, just gods, gainsay, that any drop thou borrowest from thy mother, my sacred aunt, should by my mortal sword be drained. Let me embrace thee, Ajax. By him that thunders, thou hast lusty arms. Hector would have them fall upon him thus. Cousin, all honour to thee. I thank thee, gentle Hector. Thou art too gentle and too free a man. I came to kill thee, cousin, and bear hence a great addition in it in thy death. Not Neopolitamus so mirable, so mirable, on whose bright crest fame with her looks oyes cries, This is he, could promise to himself a thought of added honour torn from Hector. Aeneas says, There is expectance here from both the sides. What further you will do? We'll answer it. The issue is embracement. Ajax, farewell. If I might in entreaties find success as Selda have the chance, I would desire my famous cousin to our Grecian tents. Tis Agamemnon's wish, and great Achilles doth long to see unarmed the valiant Hector. Aeneas, call my brother Troilus to me, and signify this loving interview to the expectors of our Trojan part. Desire them home. Give me thy hand, my cousin. I will go eat with thee and save thy knights. So they've decided not to fight because they're actually technically distantly related. 
<laughs> nice. Um, Agamemnon and the rest all come forward, and Ajax says, Great Agamemnon comes to meet us here, the worthiest of them. Tell me name by name, but for Achilles, mine own searching eyes shall find him by his large and portly size. And Agamemnon comes up and he says, Worthy of arms, as welcome as to one that would be rid of such an enemy, but that's no welcome. Understand more clear what's past and what's to come is strewed with husks and formless ruins of oblivion. But in this extant moment, faith and troth, stained purely from all hollow bias drawing, bids thee with most divine integrity, from heart of very heart, great Hector, welcome. I thank thee, most imperious Agamemnon, my well-framed lord of Troy, no less to you, he says to Troilus. Menelaus, the cuck, says, let me confirm my princely brother's greeting, you brace of warlike brothers, welcome hither. Who must we answer? The noble Menelaus. Oh, you, my lord. By Mars, his gauntlet thanks. Mock not that I affect the untraded oath. Your quondam wife swears still by Venus' glove she's well, but uh, bade me not commend her to you. Name not her now, sir. She's a deadly theme. Oh, pardon, I offend. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> that's that's so hard. She's like, yeah, your, your wife's doing good, but she, she said don't. She doesn't say hi. She, she does not say hello. <laughs> damn. <laughs> Brutal. Quantum wife. And Nestor says, I have, thou gallant Trojan, seen thee oft labouring for destiny make cruel way through ranks of Greekish youth, and I have seen thee as hot as Perseus spur thy Phrygian steed, and seen thee scorning forfeits and subduements, when thou hast hung thy advanced sword in the air, not letting it decline on the decline that I have said unto my standers by, Lo, Jupiter is yonder, dealing life. And I have seen thee pause and take thy breath, when that a ring of Greeks have hemmed thee in like an Olympian wrestling, this have I seen. But this thy countenance, still locked in steel, I never saw till now. I knew thy grandsire, and once fought with him, he was a soldier good. But by great Mars, the captain of us all, never like thee. Let an old man embrace thee, and worthy warrior welcome to our tents. Tis the old Nestor. Let me embrace thee, good old chronicle, that hast so long walked hand in hand with time. Most reverend Nestor, I'm glad to clasp thee. There's a lot of, like, bro moments here, I feel. A lot of, like, I would my arms could match thee in contention, as they contend with thee in courtesy. <laughs> What's the matter? Trojan army got you pushing too many pencils? <laughs> I would they could. Ah, by this white beard I'd fight with thee tomorrow. Well, welcome, welcome. I have seen the time. I wonder now how yonder city stands when we have here her base and pillar by us. I know your favour, Lord Ulysses, well. Ah, sir, there's many a Greek and Trojan dead since first I saw yourself and Diomed and Ilium on your Greekish embassy. Sir, I foretold you then what would ensue. My prophecy is but half his journey yet. For yonder walls that pertly front your town, yon towers whose wanton tops do bust the clouds, must kiss their own feet. I do not believe you. There they yet stand, and modestly, I think, the fall of every Phrygian stone will cost a drop of Grecian blood. The end crowns all, and that old common arbitrator. Time will one day end it. So to him we leave it. Most gentle and most valiant Hector, welcome. After the general, I beseech you next to feast with me and see me at my tent. And Achilles says, I shall forestall thee, Lord Ulysses, thou. Now, Hector, I have fed mine eyes on thee. I have with exact view perused thee, Hector, and quoted joint by joint. Is this Achilles? I am Achilles. Stand fair, I prithee. Let me look on thee. Behold thy fill. Nay, I've done already. Thou art too brief, I will the second time, as I would by thee view thee limb by limb. Oh, like a book of sport, thou wilt read me o'er, but there is more in me than thou understandst. Why dost thou so oppress me with thine eye? Tell me, you heavens, in which part of his body shall I destroy him? Whether there, or there, or there, that I may give the local wound a name and make distinct the very breach whereon Hector's great spirit flew. Answer me, heavens! It would discredit the blessed gods, proud man, to answer such a question. Stand again. Think'st thou to catch my life so pleasantly as to prenominate in nice conjecture where thou wilt hit me dead? I tell thee, yea. Were thou the oracle to tell me so, I'd not believe thee. Henceforth guard thee well, for I'll not kill thee there, nor there, nor there. But by the forge that scythed Mars his helm, I'll kill thee everywhere. Yea, o'er er and o'er, er, you wisest Grecians, pardon me this brag. His insolence draws folly from my lips, but I'll endeavour deeds to match these words, or I may never. And Ajax says, Do not cheer for thee, cousin, and you, Achilles, let these threats alone. 
Till accident or purpose bring you to it, you may every day enough of Hector if you have the stomach. The general state, I fear, can scarce entreat you to be odd with him. I pray you, let us see you in the field. We have had pelting wars since he refused the Grecian's cause. What dost thou entreat me, Hector? Tomorrow do I meet thee, fell as death. Tonight, all friends, thy hand upon that match. Agamemnon says, First all you peers of Greece go to my tent. There in the fall contrive you. Afterwards, as Hector's leisure on your bounty shall concur, together severally entreat him, beat loud the tambourines, let the trumpets blow, that this great soldier may his welcome know. They all leave, except for Troilus and Ulysses. Oh damn, so Achilles and Hector are going to have a very, going to have a big old fight. My lord Ulysses, tell me, I beseech you, in what place of the field doth Calchas keep? Of Menelaus' tents, most princely Troilus, their Diomed doth feast with him tonight, who neither looks on heaven nor on earth, but gives all gaze and bent of amorous view on the fair Cressid. Shall I, sweet lord, be bound to thee so much after we part from Agamemnon's tent to bring me thither? You shall commend me, sir, as gentle tell me of what honour was this Cressider in Troy. Had she no lover there that wails her absence? Oh, sir, to such as boasting show their scars as mock as dew. Will you walk on, my lord? She was beloved. She loved, she is, and doth, but still sweet love is food for fortunes too. Ooh. So it's going to come down to Hector v. Achilles. Uh, there's some really good lines in this that are like, bro? Yeah, bro. Like, fuck you, bro. Like, come on, then. There's loads of good moments like that. <coughs> this is water. <coughs> this is water. It is. <laughs> We're up to 22,000 already. Oh my gosh. All right, let's keep it going. Act five. We're almost at the end of Troilus and Cressida. Achilles and Patroclus comes in. Achilles is furious. He says, I'll heat his blood with Greekish wine tonight, with which my scimitar I'll cool tomorrow. Patroclus, let us feast him to the height. Uh, they're planning to get him hung over, I think. Here comes Thersites. How now, thou core of envy, thou crusty batch of nature? What's the news? Why, thou picture of what thou seem'st, an idol of idiot worshippers, here's a letter for thee. From whence, fragment? Why, thou full dish of fool from Troy? Who keeps the tent? Uh, who keeps the tent now? The surgeon's box or the patient's wound? A well-said adversity. And what need these tricks? Prithee be silent, boy. I profit not by the talk. Thou art thought to be Achilles' male varlet. Male varlet, you rogue! What's that? Why, his masculine whore. Now the rotten diseases of the South, guts griping, ruptures, catars, loads are graved to the black, lethargies, cold pauses and the like, take and take again such preposterous discoveries. Why, thou damnable box of envy, thou, what, what means thou to curse thus? Oh, do I curse thee? Why, no, you ruinous butt, you horse son indistinguishable cur, no. Why art thou then exasperated, thou idle immaterial skin of sleeve skilk, thou green sarsant flap for a sore eye, thou tassel of a prodigal's purse, thou? Ah, how would the poor world is pestered with such waterflies, diminutives of nature? Out, gall, finch, egg. Achilles interrupts this uh, <laughs> exchange of, of witticisms by saying, My speed, Patroclus. I am thwarted quite from my great purpose in tomorrow's battle. Here is a letter from Queen Hecuba, a token from her daughter, my fair love, both taxing me and gauging me to keep an oath that I have sworn. I will not break it. Fall, Greeks. Fail fame, honour or go or stay. My major vow lies here. This I'll obey. Come, come, Thersites, help to trim my tent. The night in banqueting must all be spent. Away, Patroclus! So, Patroclus and Achilles leave. Achilles is, Achilles is going to flake on the fight Thersites says with too much blood and too little brain these two may run mad but if with too much brain and too little blood they do I'll be a curer of madmen he is Agamemnon an honest fellow enough and one that loves quails but he that has not so much brain as earwax and the goodly transformation of Jupiter there his brother the bull the primitive statute and oblique memorial of cuckolds a thrifty shoeing horn in a chain hanging at his brother's leg to what form but that he is should wit larded with malice and malice forced with wit turn him to to an ass were nothing he is both ass and ox to an ox were nothing he is both ox and ass to be a dog a mule a cat a flitchew a toad a lizard an owl a potter or a herring without a row i would not care but to be menelaus ugh, i would conspire against destiny Ask me not what I would be if I were not Thersites, for I care not to be the Laos of a Lazar, so I were not Menelaus. Hoy day, spirits and fires. Damn, 
He really does not like cucks. <laughs> So here come all here comes Hector, Ajax, Agamemnon, Ulysses, Nestor, Diomedes. So it's all the Greek lads, uh, minus Achilles who's flaked, um, as well as uh, Troilus who's there and uh, Hector. So the two the two princes um, of Troy. Agamemnon says uh, we go. Wrong. Oh, it's dark, so they're all they're all carrying torches. And Agamemnon says we go wrong, we go wrong. Ajax says no, no, yonder tis tis, tis where we saw the light. Oh, I trouble you. Oh no, not a whit. Achilles comes in. Here comes himself to guide you. Welcome, brave Hector. Welcome, princes all. So now, fair prince of Troy, I bid good night. Ajax commands the guard to tend on you. Thanks and good night to the Greeks, general. Hector's nice. Good night, my lord. Good night, sweet lord Menelaus. Thersites says, sweet draught, sweet quertha, sweet stink, sweet sewer. Achilles says, good night and welcome both at once to those that go or tarry. Agamemnon says, good night. Old Nestor tarries, and you too, Diomed, keep Hector company an hour or two. I cannot, Lord, I have more important business the tide whereof is now. Oh, oh, okay. So he says, Diomedes, stay and party, and Diomedes says, I cannot, Lord, I have more important business the tide whereof is now. He's gonna go and have sex with Cressida. Well, he's sex is a euphemism at that point. Good night, great Hector. Give me your hand. <laughs> Follow his torch, he goes to Calchus' tent keep you company sweet sir you honor me so Troilus knows where he's going now Troilus knows where Cressida is and Hector says and so good night so uh, Diomedes Ulysses and Troilus exit they're off they're off to try and find Cressida and Achilles says come come enter my tent and they all leave into his tent and Thersites says that same Diomed's a false hearted rogue a most unjust knave I will no more trust him when he leers than I will a serpent when he hisses he will spend his mouth and promise like Brabler the hound but when he performs astronomers foretell it that it is prodigious there will come some change the sun borrows of the moon where Diomed keeps his word I would rather leave to see Hector than not to dog him they say he keeps a Trojan drab and uses the traitor couch as his tent I laughter nothing but lechery all incontinent varlets so Diomedes comes in, oh, I think into Calchas' tent. This scene might get a bit spicy. Diomedes comes in and says, What are you up to here, ho? What are you up to here, ho? Speak, Calchas, Cressida's father, says, Who calls? Diomed, Calchas, I think. Where's your daughter? She comes to you. Troilus and Ulysses enter and they hide. Stand where the torch may not discover us. Cressida comes in. Cressida comes forth to him. How now, my charge? Now, my sweet guardian, hark a word with you, they whisper. Yea, so familiar? She will sing any man at first sight. And any man may sing her if he can take her clef. She's noted. They're basically saying she's a slut. Diomedes says, Will you remember? Remember, yes. Nay, but do then, and let your mind be coupled with your words. What should she remember? Shh, list. Sweet honey Greek, tempt me no more to folly. Roguery. Nay, then... I'll tell you what. Foe, foe, come tell a pin you are forsworn. In faith I cannot, what would you have me do? A juggling trick. To be secretly open. What did you swear you would bestow on me? I prithee do not hold me to my oath. Bid me do anything but that, sweet Greek. Sweet Greek. Good night. Hold patience. How now, Trojan? Diomed. No, no, good night. Be a fool no more. Thy better must. Hark one word in your ear. Oh, plague and madness. You are moved, prince. Let us depart, I pray you. Lest your displeasure should enlarge itself to wrathful term. This place is dangerous. The time right deadly. I beseech you, go. Behold, I pray you. Nay, good my lord, go off. You floor to great distraction. Come, my lord, I pray thee, stay. You have not patience. Come, I pray you, stay. By hell and hell torments, I will not speak a word. And then Diomedes and Cressida are still having a conversation. Diomedes says, and so good night. Nay, but you part in anger. Doth that grieve thee, a withered truth? Why, how now, Lord? By Jove, I will be patient. Guardian, why, Greek, foe, foe, adieu, you palter. In faith, I do not come hither once again. You shake, my lord, at something will you go, you will break out. She strokes his cheek. Come, come, nay, stay. By Jove, I will not speak a word. There is between my will and all offences a guard of patience. Stay a little while. Thersity says, how the devil luxury with his fat rump and potato finger tickles these together. Fry, lechery, fry. But will you then? In faith, I will, lo, never trust me else. Give me some token for the surety of it. I'll fetch you one. You have sworn patience. Fear me not, sweet lord. I will not be myself nor have contagion of what I feel. I am all patience. 
Cressida enters with Troilus's token. Now the pledge. Now, now, now. Here, Diomed, keep this sleeve. O oh, beauty, where is thy faith? My lord, I will be patient. Outwardly, I will. You look upon that sleeve, behold it well. He loved me. Oh, false wench, give it me again. So she's changed her mind. Who's worst? It is no matter now, I have to again. I, I will not meet with you tomorrow night. I pray thee, Diomed, visit me no more. Now she sharpens well. Where's well, well said, whetstone? I shall have it. What, this? I, that. Oh, all you gods, oh, pretty, pretty pledge. Thy master now lies thinking in his bed of thee and me and sighs and takes my glove and gives memorial dainty kisses to it as I kiss thee. Nay, do not snatch it from me. He that takes th that takes my heart with all. I had your heart before. This follows it. I did swear, patience. You shall not have it, Diomed. Faith you shall not. I'll give you something else. I will have this. Whose was it? It is no matter. Come tell me whose it was. T'was one that loved me better than you will. But now you have it. Take it. Whose was it? By all Diana's waiting woman yond, and by herself I will not tell you whose. Tomorrow will I wear it on my helm, and grieve his spirit that dares not challenge it. Were thou the devil and worst it on thy horn, it should be challenged. Well, well, tis done, tis past, and yet tis not, I will not keep my word. Why then, farewell. Thou never shalt mock Diomed again. You shall not go. One, one cannot speak a word, but it straight starts you. I do not like this fooling. Nor I, by Pluto. But that that likes not me pleases me best. What shall I come? The hour? I come, O oh Jove, do come. I shall be plagued. Farewell till then. Good night. I prithee come. Troilus, farewell. One eye yet looks on thee. But with my heart the other eye doth see. Oh, poor our sex. The fault in us I find, the error of our eye directs our mind, what error leads must err, or then conclude mine swayed by eyes are full of turpitude. And she leaves. So, so, uh, that was possibly a little unclear. Cressida has basically agreed to date Diomedes. She's reluctant about it, but, but, she's, she's going to date him. Um. Uh, I'm coming up, is up for coming on for these questions in about two to the next ten minutes. But what? Only three for the next ten minutes. All right, give me one minute. We might have a special uh, guest. Um, let me just look ahead and see who's a good role. Um, <laughs> sorry, give me one moment. I'm just looking ahead because we might have a very special guest on, but who might? Um, <laughs> would he like to be Achilles, or or possibly Hector? It'd be more to do if he was Hector. What's that? Cool, cool, cool. Um, well, yeah, just keep me posted. There may be a special guest to come on to play. Uh, yeah, Hector. There'd be a, there'd be plenty to do as Hector, um, and if he's going to be free for a short time, then Achilles is. There's the, there's a fight between them coming up. Anyway, um, Cressida and Diomedes are going to date. Um, Troilus is gutted. Um, and so on and so on and so on where were we up to um, oh yeah she's just left um, Thersites uh, is making fun of them Yeah, uh, Troilus says to make a recordation to my soul of every syllable that here was spoke but if I tell how these two did coact shall I not lie in publishing a truth sith yet there is a credence in my heart an esperance so obstinately strong that doth invert the test of eyes and ears as if those organs had deceptious functions created only to culminate was crested here I cannot conjure, Trojan. She was not, sure. Most sure she was. Why, then, my negation hath no test of madness. Nor mine, my lord. Cressid was here but now. Let it not be believed for womanhood. Think we had mothers do not give advantage to stubborn critics out without a theme for deprivation to square the general sex by Cressid's rule. Rather think this not Cressid. What hath she done, prince, that can soil our mothers? Nothing at all, unless that this was she. Will he swagger himself out on his own eyes? This she? No, this is Diomed's Cressida. If beauty have a soul, this is not she. If souls guide vows, if vows are sanctimony, if sanctimony be the gods' delight, if there be rule in unity itself, this is not she. O oh, madness of discourse, that cause sets up with and against thyself by foul authority, where reason can revolt without perdition, and loss assume all reason without revolt, this is and is not Cressid. Within my soul there doth conduce a fight of this strange nature, that a thing inseparate divides more wider than the sky and earth, and yet the spacious breadth of this division admits no orifex for a point as subtle as Ariadne's broken woof to enter. Instant 
Silence, O oh instance, strong as Pluto's gates, Cressid is mine, tied with the bonds of heaven. Instance, O oh instance, strong as heaven itself, The bonds of heaven are slipped, dissolved and loose, And with another knot five finger tied. The fractions of her faith, aughts of her love, The fragments, scraps and bits and greasy relics Of her uh, eaten faith are bound to diamed. May worthy Troilus be half attached With that which with his passion doth express. I, Greek, and that shall be divulged well in characters as red as Mars, his heart inflamed with Venus. Never did young man fancy with so eternal and so fixed a soul. Hark, Greek, as much I do as Cressid love, so much by weight hate her I, Diomed. That sleeve is mine that he'll bear in his helm, wherein a cask composed by Vulcan's skull my sword should bite it. Not the dreadful spout which shipmen do the hurricano call, constringed in mass by the almighty Fen, shall dizzy with more clamour Neptune's ear in his descent than shall my prompted sword falling on Diomed. He'll tickle it for his concubine. O oh, Cressid, O oh, false Cressid, false, 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 let all untruths stand by thy stained name and they'll seem glorious. Or oh, contain yourself, your passion draws ears hither. Aeneas comes in. He's still on a horse, apparently. I've been seeking you this hour, my lord. Hector, by this, is arming him in Troy. Ajax, your guard, stays to conduct you home. Have with you, prince. My courteous lord, adieu. Farewell, revolted fair. And Diomed, stand fast and wear a castle on thy head. I'll bring you to the gates. Accept distracted thanks. Everybody leaves but Thersites. We said, would I could meet that rogue Diomed. I would croak like a raven. I would bode. I would bode. Patroclus gives me anything but the intelligence of this whore. The parrot will not do more for an almond than he for a commoditous drab. Lechery. Lechery. Still wars and lechery. Nothing else holds fashion. A burning devil take them. Oh, damn. Troilus is so pissed that he's been cucked. I mean, he hasn't even been cucked. All right. How are we doing? No worries. Well, here comes Hector and, Ag and um, Andromache. And Andromache says, uh, Oh, I think that's Hector's wife. I think. She's about to be his wife. When was my lord so much ungently tempered to stop his ears against admonishment? Unarm, unarm, and do not fight today. You train me to offend you. Get you gone. By all the everlasting gods, I'll go. Oh, so she's like, don't fight. I don't want you to go. And he's like, nah, come on, I need to fight. My dreams will sure prove ominous to the day. No more, I say. Cassandra comes in. Where is my brother Hector? Here, sister, armed and bloody and intent, consort with me in loud and dear petition. Pursue we him on knees, for I have dreamt of bloody turbulence, and this whole night hath nothing been but shapes and forms of slaughter. Oh, tis true. Ho, oh, bid my trumpet sound. No notes of Sally for the heavens, sweet brother. Be gone, I say, the gods have heard me swear. The gods are deaf to hot and peevish vows. They are polluted offerings, more abhorred than spotted livers in the sacrifice. Oh, be persuaded, do not count it holy to hurt by being just. It is as lawful for we should give much to use violent thefts and rob in the behalf of charity. It is the purpose that makes strong the vow, but vows to every purpose must not hold. Unarm, sweet Hector, hold you still, I say. Mine honour keeps the weather of my fate. Life every man holds dear, but the dear man holds honour far more precious dear than life. Troilus comes in. How now, young man? Means thou to fight today? Andromache says, Cassandra, call my father to persuade. No, faith, young Troilus, doff thy harness, youth. I am today the vein of chivalry. Let grow thy sinews till thou not be strong, and tempt not yet the brushes of the war. Unarm thee, go, and doubt thou not, brave boy, I'll stand today for thee and me and Troy. Brother, you have a vice of mercy in you which better fits a lion than a man. What vice is that? Good Troilus, chide me for it. When many times the captive Grecian falls, even in the fan and wind of your bare sword, you bid them, ride, you bid them rise and live. Ah, tis fair play. Fool's play by heaven, Hector. How now, how now? For the love of all the gods, let's leave the hermit pity with our mothers, and when we have our armours buckled on, the venomed vengeance ride upon our swords, spur them to ruthful work, rein them from ruth. Fie, savage, fie. Hector, then tis wars. Troilus, I would not have you fight today. Who should withhold me? Not fate, obedience, nor the hand of Mars, beckoning with fiery truncheon my retire. Not Priamus and Hecuba on knees, their eyes are galled with recourse of tears. Nor you, my brother, with your true sword drawn, opposed to hinder me, should stop my way, but by my ruin. Enter Priam and Cassandra. Lay hold upon him, Priam, hold him fast, he is thy crutch. Now if thou lose thy stay, thou on him leaning, and all Troy on thee, fall all together. Come, Hector, come, go back. Thy wife hath damped, thy mother hath had visions, Cassandra doth for she, and I myself am like a prophet, shunly and rapt, to tell thee that this day is ominous, therefore come back. 
Aeneas is a field, and I do stand engaged to many Greeks, even in the faith of valour, to appear this morning to them. Aye, but thou shalt not go. I must not break my faith. You know me, dutiful, therefore, dear sir, let not me shame respect, but give me leave to take that course by your consent and voice, which you do here forbid me, royal Priam. And Cassandra says, O oh, Priam, yield not to him. Do not, dear father. Andromache, I am offended with you. Upon the love you bear me, get you in. He sends his wife in. Troilus says, These foolish, dreaming, superstitious girl make all these bodements. Cassandra, Oh, farewell, dear Hector. Look how thou diest. Look how thou eye turns pale. Look how thy wounds do bleed at many vents. Hark how Troy roars. How Hecuba cries out. How poor Andromache shrills her dollar forth. Behold, distraction, frenzy, and amazement. Like witless antics, one another meet, and all cry, Hector, Hector's dead. Oh, Hector. Troilus says, Away, away. Farewell, yes, soft Hector, I take my leave. Thou dost thyself and all our Troy deceive. Cassandra leaves. Hector says, You are amazed, my liege, at her exclaim. Go in and cheer the town. We'll forth and fight. Do deeds of praise and tell them, tell you them at night. Priam says, Farewell. The gods of safety stand about thee. Priam and Hector leave separately. Dun, 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 dun. They are at it. Hark, proud diamond, I believe. I come to lose my arm or win my sleeve. Pandarus comes in. Do you hear, my lord? Do you hear? What now? Here's a letter come from yond poor girl. Let me read. A horse and tissic, a horse and racically tissic, so troubles me in the foolish fortune of this girl, and what one thing, what another, that I shall leave you other days. And I have room in my eyes too, and such an ache in my bones, that unless a man were cursed, I cannot tell what to think on. What says she there? Words, words, mere words, no matter from the heart, he tears the letter up. The effect doth operate another way, go wind to wind, their turn and change together. My love with words and errors still she feeds, but edifies another with her deeds. Yeah, <laughs> She's riding off. Yeah. What's that? Uh, he's riding off to, to fight. Thersites comes in. We love him. You love to see him. Now they are clapper clawing one another. I'll go look on. That dissembling abominable varlet Diomed has got that same scurvy, doting, foolish young knave sleeve of Troy there in his helm. I would fain see them meet that at some young Trojan ass that loves the whore there might send the Greekish whore masterly villain with the sleeve back to the dissembling luxurious drab of a sleeveless errand. Hello. Uh, I'm not hearing anyone. Hello, I think we have a guest. Well, um, well, Hector's line is about to come up, so that would be epic. Um, currently, I don't hear a guest, but um, anyway, uh, everyone's going off to fight. Troilus comes, uh, Diomedes and Troilus comes in. They hate each other. Um, Troilus says, "Fly not, for thou shalt take the river Styx. I would swim after." And Diomedes says, "Thou must miscall. Thou dost miscall. Retire. I do not fly, but advantageous care withdrew me from the odds of multitude. Have at thee." Hold thy whore, Grecian. Now for thy whore, Trojan. Now the sleeve, now the sleeve. They fight. And they leave and they fight. And enter Hector. Apparently not. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Somebody says Bernie Sanders is Achilles. That would be great. No, uh, maybe there'll be a Hector. Maybe there'll be an Achilles. Who knows? But the fight, the battle goes on. Um, uh, anyway, Hector comes in and says, What art thou, Greek? Art thou for Hector's match? Art thou of blood and honour? And Thursday says, No, no, I'm a rascal, a scurvy, rattling knave, a very filthy rogue. I do believe thee. Live. And he leaves. God of mercy, that thou wilt believe me, but a plague break thy neck for frighting me. What's become of the wrenching rogues? I think they have swallowed one another. I would laugh at that miracle, yet in a sort, lechery eats itself. I'll seek them. Diomedes comes in with his servants. He says, go, go, my servant, take that Troilus horse. Present the fair steed to my lady Cressid. Fellow, command my service to her beauty. Tell her I have chastised the amorous Trojan, and I'm her knight by proof. I go, my lord. Good problems here. Problems me? Okay. All right. Give us a minute to do technical issues. Sorry, everyone. If you literally just move yourself to your green room. Okay. Which one do you have to do? Like, you just go to Discord. 
I'm just click on the Eagle Free name. Here? Uh, no, green room. This, oh, green room, here. So I need to go into green room voice? Yeah, and have the listening. Okay. Because it's streaming from your account, so wherever you are, it All right, give us, a, give us a minute here. Uh, Can people still hear me on the stream? I think it's for Ask the Chat. What's that? Chat, can you still hear me? Yeah, they can still hear me. Fantastic. Is there anyone else there? Yeah, everyone else is talking. Can you hear me? No. No, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Sorry, I can't hear. Wait, I'm, no, it's my fault. I, I realise what it is. Oh wait, no, no, it's not. I, it's not me. Sorry, I can't. I can't hear anyone else in the green room. Sorry, sorry, everyone. It's um, yeah. Um, we could go to intermission for a few minutes if you want. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, right. Before the final uh, battle commences, let's go to an intermission for a few minutes while we try and sort this out.
you want to try and say something or and i can hear you oh. okay amazing if we can get fox back okay we can indeed he said he was going to come back after stream can hear us by the way <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, well, it's coming up, um, and so is Achilles, so, I mean, he can have anything he wants. All right. All right, so, um, that, yeah, that's it. I can, <laughs> I can go, I can go ahead and get out of your way now. Um, I, I thought maybe after yesterday you might like having the, uh, the Church of the Orthodox Gamer representation. So yeah, yeah thank you. Time. Okay, okay, we are now, we are now back, um. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for bearing with us in those technical issues. In the meantime, anyway, back to Troy. Back to the battle before the walls of Troy. Um, uh, Agamemnon just ran in. Um, uh, everyone's dying. Everyone's getting chopped up. And Agamemnon says, Renew, renew the fierce of Polydamas hath beat down men on bastard Margalon hath Dorius prisoner and stands Colossus wise waving his beam upon the pashid corpses of the kings Estrophius and Cadius. Polyxenes is slain, Epiphamacus and Thaurus deadly hurt, Patroclus tail slain and Palmides sore hurt and bruised. The dreadful sagittary appalls our numbers. Haste we die amid to reinforcement or we perish all. Even Nestor's joining in on the fight. He's coming in like, go bear Patroclus' body to Achilles and bid the snail paste Ajax arm for shame. There is a thousand hectares in the field. Now he fights on Gallop and his horse and there lacks work anon he's there afoot and there they fly or die like scalded skulls before the belching whale then he is yonder and there the straying Greeks right for his edge fall down before him like the mowers swathe he there and everywhere he leaves and takes dexterity so obeying appetite that what he will he does and does so much that proof is called impossibility hello 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 can you hear me hello I can hear you yes oh, it's working. Oh, welcome nice to meet you. welcome it's lovely to meet you too <laughs> We are we are okay, closing so, in on the final battle. Would you like to be Hector or Achilles? Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll be Hector. Where, where am I reading? Where am I reading? Um, Alice mm. should hopefully be able to, to sort you out. Um, uh, we are about to start Act Five, Scene Six, and Hector doesn't have any lines for a little bit. So they, Alice, will be able to set you up. But yeah, hello. Act um, I five, will. Uh, six. Okay. Guests um, with. Sonic. Is there a space in Sonic Fox, or is it just one? No, no space. No space. Not this box as Hector. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Hector. Let's go. All right. I'm gonna say a couple of lines. Okay. I mean, and then, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, not... I, I'm not good at. I'm not good at this. So I'll do don't, my best. Don't worry. It's all just for the laughs. Ah. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. So, um, Ajax comes in. Troilus, thou coward, Troilus. I there, there. So draw we together, and Achilles comes in. Where is this Hector? Come, come, thou boy, Queller, show thy face. Know what it is to meet Achilles angry. Hector, where is Hector? I will none but Hector. Ajax runs in. Troilus, thou coward Troilus, sure thy head. Diomedes runs in. Troilus, I say, where's Troilus? What wouldst thou? I would correct him. Were I the general, thou shouldst have my office ere that correction. Troilus, I say, what Troilus? Troilus comes in. O oh, traitor Diomed, turn thy false face, thou traitor, and pay thou life they owest me for my horse. Ha, art thou there? I'll fight them alone. Stand, Diomed. He's my prize, they will not look upon. Come, both you cogging Greeks, have at you both. They fight. Shit, the light. <laughs> Hector comes in. Yeah, Troilus. Oh, well fought, my youngest brother. <laughs> now do I see thee. Have at thee, Hector. Pass, <laughs> if thou wilt. If I do disdain thy courtesy, proud Trojan, be happy that my arms are out of use. My resting negligence befriends thee thou, but thou anon shalt hear of me again. Till when, go seek thy fortune, and I leave. Fare thee well. I would have been much more a fresher man had I expected thee. How now, my brother? Troilus comes in. Ajax hath taken Aeneas. Shall it be? No, by the flame of yonder glorious heaven, he shall not carry him. I'll be ta'en too, or bring him off. Fate, hear me what I say. I reck not thou, though I'll end my life today. Someone else runs in in armor. Stand, stand now, thou Greek. Thou art a goodly mark. No, but thou not. I like thy armor well. I'll freshen and lock the rivets all. But I'll be a master of it. Wilt thou not? 
beast abide why then fly on i'll hunt thee for thy hide ha he runs after whoever that greek is achilles comes in where there's somebody else i'm come here about me you my mirrodons mark oh that's his bodyguards mark me what i say attend me where i wheel strike not a stroke but keep yourselves in breath and when i have the bloody hector found impale him with your weapons round about in fellest manner execute your arm follow me sirs in my proceedings i it is decreed hector the great must die uh, meanwhile, Thersites enters at a distance. Menelaus is fighting Paris, so it's Cuck v. the guy who cucked him. And Thersites says, The cockled on the cockled maker are at it. Now bull, now dog. Luke Paris, Lou. Now my double hen sparrow. Luke Paris, Lou. The bull has the game. Wear horns. Um, and then somebody tries to kill him and says, Turn, slave, and fight. What art thou? A bastard son of Priam's. I'm a bastard too. I love bastards. I'm a bastard begot. Bastard instructed. Bastard in mind. Bastard in valor. And everything illegitimate. One bear will not bite another. And wherefore should one bastard? Take heed. The quarrel's most ominous to us. If the son of a whore fight for a whore, he tempts judgment. Farewell, bastard. The devil take thee, coward. And he runs off. Hector runs in again. Oh, uh, enter Hector at C7? Yeah. Act 5, okay, scene well, 9. Scene 9, sorry. Most petrified coy, so fair without. Thy godly armor does have cost thy life. Now is my day's work done, I'll take good breath. Rest, sword, thou hast thou full of blood and death. But here comes Achilles. Oh, look, Hector. How the sun begins to set. How ugly night comes breathing at his heels. Even with the veil and darkening of the sun to close the day up. Hector's life is done. I am unarmed. For a gold advantage, Greek. No, we attack and Hector falls. <laughs> we just, ah! we just fucking murder the no! shit out of him. Ah! <laughs> strike, fellows, strike! This is the man I seek. So Ilium, fall thou. Now Troy, sink down. Here lies thy heart, thy sinews, and thy bone. On Myrmidons, cry all you amain. Achilles hath the mighty Hector slain. <laughs> Hark! A retreat upon our Grecian part. The Trojan trumpet sounds delight, my lord. The dragon wing of night o'erspreads the earth, and stickler like the army separates. My half-supped sword that frankly would have fed, pleased with this dainty bait, thus goes to bed. Come tie his body to my horse's tail. Along the field I will a Trojan tail. Ha! And then I drag your corpse around the walls of Troy. <laughs> and that's how that goes. <laughs> Do you want to play? <laughs> Do you want to play any of the rest? There's only two scenes left. <laughs> Only two scenes left? Hold up. Okay, uh, I, I actually closed it out. I need to open it again. Hold up. <laughs> no worries. Oh, wait, where is it? Where is it? I think I, I actually, I don't think I did close it. Did I? I sent him actually, yeah. Uh, can, I get, can I get a link to it again, actually? Yeah, goddamn. No worries. Um, who can you be? Uh, you could close it out okay. if you want. You could be Pandarus, Cressida's uncle, who has the final lines. Um, okay, I'll, I, we're, 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 we're on scene eight right now. Um, we are uh, Act 5, Scene 10 Pandarus doesn't come in until the very end He has the final final lines of the play um, Oh god, I don't want to uh, 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 Sure, I guess I'm in, I'm or, or you can be Troilus, who's the lead <laughs> <laughs> Fuck uh, <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be Troilus, I guess Okay, cool um, So, uh, Agamemnon and all the I'll Greek the person lads. that I killed <laughs> Agamemnon and all the Greek lads come in and Agamemnon says hark hark what shout is that peace drums Achilles Hector is slain Achilles the brute is Hector slain and by Achilles if it be sore yet bragless let it be great Hector was a man as good as he much march patiently along let one be sent to pray Achilles see us at our tent if in his death the gods have us befriended great Troy is ours and our sharp wars are ended all the Greek lads leave in come the Trojan lads who've just had their asses kicked and Aeneas says, Stand ho! Yet are we masters of the field, never go home. Here starve we out the night. Enter Troilus. Hector slain. Hector? The gods the forbid! Hector! The gods forbid! <laughs> <laughs> He's dead. And the murder murderer's hoist tail, and beastly so it dragged to the shameful field. Frown on, you heavens, affect your rage with speed. Sit gods upon your thrones and smile at Troy. I say at once, let your brief plagues be mercy. And lingering, not harsh, destroy destructions on. My lord, you do discomfort all the host. You un understand me not, that tell me so. I do not speak a flight of fear of death, but dare all em eminence that gods and men address their dangers in. Hector is gone. Who shall tell Priam so, or Hecuba? Let him, let him that will screech owl I be called. Go into Troy and say there, Hector is dead. There is word will Priam turn to stone, make wells and neobies of the 
maids and wives, cold statues of the youth and in words, scared Troy of itself. But march away, Hector is dead, there's no more to say. Stay yet, you vile, abominable tents. Thus proudly pite upon our Phrygian plains, let Titan rise as early as he dare. I'll let through and through you, and, thou great-sized coward, no space of earth shall sunder our two hates. I'll haunt thee like a wicked conscience still, that mold of goblins swift as frenzied thoughts. Strike a free march to Troy, with comfort go. Hope of revenge shall hide our inward woe. And here comes Pandarus. But hear you, hear you. Hence, broker lackey, ignominy and shame. Pursue thy life, and live I with thy name. And then he runs away. And Pandarus Out says, of there. He's just done. Mic drop. Out. <laughs> Pandora says, a goodly medicine for my aching bones. O world, 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 thus is the poor agent despised. O traitors and boards, how earnestly are you set a work, and how ill requited. Why should our endeavour be so desired, and the performance so loathed? What verse for it? What instance for it? Let me see. Full merrily the humble bee doth sing, till he hath lost his honey and his sting. And being once subdued in armoured tail, sweet honey and sweet notes together fail. Good traders in the flesh, set this in your painted cloths. As many as be here of Panda's hall, your eyes half out, weep out at Panda's fall. Or if you cannot weep, yet give some groans, though not for me, yet for your aching bones. Brethren and sisters of the whole door trade, some two months hence my will shall here be made. It should be now, but that my fear is this, some galled goose of Winchester would hiss. Till then I'll sweat and seek about for eases, and at that time bequeath you my diseases. End of the play. <laughs> oh, ah! That was sick. That was sick. Well done. You were fantastic. Thank you so much. Just thank you so much for inviting me. No, <laughs> my pleasure. Um, Shakespeare. No, not at all. Is there anything you'd like to plug while you're while you're here? Um, I'm doing my own charity stream right now, so if you guys have time to stop by, um doing the one for the trevor project oh. um there's a bunch of incentives for me to do a bunch of dumb shit so if you like see me doing dumb stuff just come to twitch.tv slash sonic box but other than that nope that's all i got thanks oh, for having me it was a pleasure to, to a pleasure to meet you thank you so yeah, much for also, coming also, also thanks for the recent nod in your most recent video everybody was like losing it i was like oh <laughs> yeah i thought you'd like that <laughs> that was so funny <laughs> thank you my so pleasure, much my though, pleasure. I, take I, it I, easy Right. Have a good day. Take it easy. Bye. Um, well, thank you so much to Sonic Fox for coming on and being uh, being Hector and Troilus at the end. Um, I think probably now we'll take a 15 minute intermission and then it's on to the two gentlemen of Verona. <laughs> um, well, that's given me a lot of energy. Thank you so much to everyone who came on for that. And we are at $23,730, which is uh, a truly staggering amount of money to raise for like what a, like, what a cause. Like, whoa. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. Um, let's go into mission. I have to pee. I'll take 15 minutes, have a cup of tea, and then we'll come back with two gentlemen of Verona.